Good morning, everyone. If I could ask you all to please take your seats. Uh, my name is James Person. I, um, with the Korea Studies program here at, at Johns Hopkins SICE, great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this very important event on Korea's March 1st movement. Um, great pleasure of mine to introduce um, our Vice Dean, Dr. Ken Calder, who serves as Vice Dean for Faculty Affairs and International Research Cooperation. He is also the director of the Edwin O. Reischauer Center for East Asia Studies and served from 2016 to 2018 as director of our Asia programs. Uh, before arriving at, at SAIS, uh, Dr. Calder served as a special advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to Japan, uh, Japan chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, uh, professor at Princeton University, lecturer at Harvard, and as the first executive director of, of Harvard University's uh, program on U.S.-Japan relations. Dr. Calder received his Ph.D. from Harvard in, in 1979, where he worked under the direction of uh, uh, Edwin O. Reischauer. Uh, he is a specialist on, on the East Asian political economy and spent 11 years uh, living in the region, including in Japan and in other uh, countries. Uh, he's done quite a lot of research on Korea uh, and really was, was present at the creation of uh, Korea studies here at SAIS. Uh, he was the first director of the, uh, of the Korea Initiative uh, and, and was very instrumental in, in developing an independent uh, Korea studies uh, concentration here at SAIS. So great pleasure to welcome him uh, to give some remarks on, on uh, behalf of SAIS. So Dr. Calder, thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, we really are fortunate to have Dr. Person uh, with us. Uh, I think most of you know his own uh, distinguished background. That will come out uh, along the way. His work with the Wilson Center. Um, just recently, of course, uh, he unearthed uh, letters from the British National Archives written by Kim Kyu-shik. Um, in which the name Republic of Korea uh, was noted for the first time. So uh, in an event commemorating the March 1st movement, it seems to me it's very uh, appropriate to have him uh, introduce uh, this particular session. Of course, it's also a, a, a session which is very, very important in a, in a range of ways. Um, we're honored to have Ambassador Yon Jae Cho, Amba Assemblyman Jong Kui Lee, and of course uh, Dean Jong Gil Yu, uh, with whom we've been working for the past several months, and we're delighted that this event uh, is the culmination and the initiation of an important new program uh, between the KDI school, uh, which he heads, and SICE. And I'll come back to that uh, later. But let me just say that our Dean uh, Valley Nasser, uh, who actually is on his way across the Pacific this moment, we have a 75th anniversary uh, uh, commemoration of SICE itself um, in uh, Hong Kong that unfortunately made it difficult for him to be here. Uh, Davesh Kapoor, our uh, new d director of Asia programs, also is out of the country on another assignment. But as I say, it gives me special pleasure because I've been involved in various ways uh, uh, with uh, Korea uh, SICE relationship uh, over the years, both with the Korea Initiative as a doctor person mentioned I was a visiting professor at Seoul National University and have students who are teaching there and at uh, several other uh, universities in Korea as well as American students who are playing um, some, some s significant roles in Korea-US uh, relations. I should also say we're delighted that we have so many of our Korean students our Korean students are some of the very best students uh, that we have. And some of them have gone on, as I think many of you know, to very distinguished positions, such as uh, Yoon Yong-gwan, who was 
not just professor of Seoul National University, but also uh, foreign minister uh, of Korea. Um, I really should say a word about this uh, special day and about the events uh, that it commemorates. Uh, I was inspired uh, as I came down Massachusetts Avenue this morning and passed the statue of Thomas Masaryk, the uh, founder of um, the Republic of Czechoslovakia, uh, just beyond DuPont Circle and, and others, other leaders of, of that uh, global uh, transformation in the wake of uh, the uh, Peace of Versailles and uh, Woodrow Wilson's um, uh, inspirations for national self-determination. Um, the 100 years ago in the work, wake of World War I, of course, that, when there was that uh, global rethinking of the role of, of, of empires and uh, widespread resistance to, among colonial peoples, to the concept of imperial, uh, imperial control. And Korea uh, was a major uh, piece of that uh, global, uh, global uh, rethinking and what ultimately became, of course, a transformation. Uh, the people of Korea, along with people throughout the colonial world, demanded their independence. Although it took, of course, uh, a struggle of a generation and more until that was achieved, the March 1st movement itself led to a flowering of national and nationalist culture in Korea. The event marked a peak formative period of Korea's struggle for nationhood, of course, a thousand years and more. But in terms of modern Korea, of course, an extremely important period. In the wake of the events uh, in Korea in 1919, resistance groups in Shanghai established the Korean provisional government of the newly declared uh, Republic of Korea. And we are honored and pleased that uh, a professor person has been has been able to find some significant historical documents regarding this that were uh, just announced, I understand, in the Korean media uh, in this last week. And copies of that, I see several people have those. Uh, and I'm delighted that SICE can contribute in some uh, small way to the understanding of the events of 1919. Those events of 1919, of course, continue to shape Korea today. Not long after its uh, establishment, the independence movement split into two opposing ideological camps, a division that became institutionalized decades later into the states that we know uh, today as South Korea and North Korea. The impact of the March 1st movement and of some similar element, uh, movements throughout the colonial world in 1919, I think also of another of those statues on Massachusetts Avenue, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, who was, began his movement uh, of nonviolent uh, struggle for independence uh, in 1919 as well in, in South Africa. Uh, it, was, it, it, it was a outpouring, as I have said. They transformed, those events transformed the international system and shaped the states that emerged after decolonization. Um, so, so this is, a, is an auspicious time and commemorates an event that is important not only in Korean history but also in global history. So I think it's very appropriate also that it's the inaugural event of this new SICE KDI school partnership. Having been present at the uh, beginning, as Dr. Person said, of Korean studies uh, here at SICE, 
more than a decade ago. And that time, of course, has gone very fast. I'm delighted to see that, as you can see from the audience that we have here and so many uh, Korean Studies students, that I also think for sure will the numbers will increase in future years, uh, especially through the partnership that we're establishing. Um, and we, we feel sure that this will create new opportunities for our students and also for, uh, for research. And that this conference uh, that I know is going to be successful will just be the first of several undertakings of this kind between the KDI school and SICE. I certainly hope, uh, of course, that that is the case. Um, it's a special occasion for us today, I should also say, uh, to have with us uh, the distinguished ambassador uh, of the Republic of Korea, uh, Cho Yun Jae. Um, he has been serving here as ambassador since being appointed in 2017 by um, President Moon Jae-in. Uh, he's known particularly for his broad background in both uh, global economics and international finance, as I think you know. Uh, he has worked in uh, a range of related areas and has served with uh, the World Bank and also with the International Monetary Fund. In addition to that, he also served as uh, Korea's ambassador to the United Kingdom from 2005 to 2008, and also as a economic advisor to former President uh, uh, No Mu Hyun from 2003 to 5. Um, just before the recent election in Korea, he also uh, headed uh, what is now President Moon Jae-in's policy uh, think tank during the campaign of 2017. So he's a policy maker, he's a diplomat, and he's also a scholar. He's honorary professor currently of international studies at Sogong University. Ambassador Cho, it's our great honor to have you with us. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Caldo, for your very kind introduction. Thank you. Dean Yu Jong-il of KDI School and uh, uh, Honorable Lee jong member of the National Assembly of Korea, ladies and gentlemen. 100 years ago, uh, the people of Korea rose up for freedom. Men and women, young and old, uh, from all across the country. They marched together as one. They marched for independence, for freedom, and for peace and uh, ideas that are embodied in the Korean Declaration of Independence. The peaceful movement was a uh, violent violently suppressed by the Japanese uh, colonial authorities, but the ideas it unleashed could not be contained. The marches led to the establishment of uh, the Provisional Republic of Korea government, and so the aspiration of 1919 became the foundation for our independence as well as the thriving and prosperous democracy which we in modern Korea has, have achieved. Looking back, it is striking how the March 1st movement was inspired by Woodrow Wilson's ideas of self-determination, one of the important American contributions to Korean independence. Today, our two countries 
our close partners and allies brought together by our common values and the shared interests. In that sense, it is fitting that we are here in Washington, D.C. to commemorate this historic movement. I thank both the John, uh, Johns Hopkins SAIS Korea Studies Program and KDI for co-organizing this timely conference. <coughs> Excuse me. The people of Korea are right to be proud of our many achievements of the past century. But as we embark on the next 100 years, we still face many challenges, including the establishment of a permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula. We are already taking bold new steps in this direction. Although the U.S.-North Korea summit meeting in Hanoi did not bring about the result we had hoped, the U.S. and the North Korea both expressed their commitment to continuing the talks. So this much is clear. The train is already on the move. There may be peaks and valleys ahead, but we are heading towards the goal of a new Korean Peninsula of peace and cooperation. Throughout this process, the U.S. is and will remain our indispensable partner. We'll continue to consult closely with the U.S. as well as cooperate with our neighbors and the wider international community. Our current challenges may be different from theirs, but the hopes and the aspirations of the March 1st movement will continue to inspire and motivate us. So today, I truly hope that the distinguished panelists and the participants in this conference will discuss the events of the past century uh, in Korean uh, with an eye to, towards the hun next 100 years in the uh, spirit of uh, in Korean words, ongo jishin, or reviewing the old to learn the new. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to uh, introduce really a, a, a figure who has been absolutely crucial in this developing relationship between uh, SAIS and Korea. Um, Dr. Yongil Yu, he's currently Dean of the uh, Korea Development Institute School of Public Policy and Management, as you know. Uh, he comes also from a very distinguished background, and let me just say a word about that. He graduated from Seoul National University and received his PhD in economics from Harvard University. He taught at Cambridge University, Notre Dame University, and Ritsumeikan uh, University in Japan before taking a professorship at the KDI school. He's also held a variety of visiting professorships elsewhere, including University of California, San Diego, and Beijing University uh, in China. Um, you know many of his publications, but uh, he's focused particularly on economic growth and income distribution, macroeconomic and development policies, and labor issues. He's also been active as a policy advisor and served as a member of the Presidential Commission on Northeast Asian Economic Hub and chaired the Special Committee on Economic Democracy of the Democratic Party. In addition, he also served as a member of the Public Funds Management Committee, the Advisory Committee for Constitutional Revision at, in the National Assembly, and on the Commission on Financial Administration Reform. Um, in addition, in addition, 
uh, as a leader in the civic movement, in addition to his policy roles and to his academic positions, Dr. Yu is currently head of the Knowledge Cooperative for Good Governance, which is a network of researchers, and he also serves as president of Jubilee Bank, which is an NGO working to help debt-stricken lower-income individuals. Dr. Yu, we look forward very much to your remarks. Welcome to SICE. Professor Kolda, uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I wonder how he came to know so much about me. <clears throat> uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of uh, KDI School of Public Policy and Management, I am deeply honored and pleased uh, to welcome you to this conference commemorating the centennial anniversary of uh, the March 1st movement. I'm also uh, grateful to the Honorable Jong Lee, uh, actually my close friend, <laughs> and a member of the National Assembly of uh, the Republic of Korea. And also he's the chairman of uh, uh, what? Uh, the Special Committee for Commemoration of the March 1st Movement and the Provisional Government. And uh, I'm very much indebted to His Excellency uh, Jo Yun Jae, Ambassador of Republic of Korea, from whom we just uh, heard the uh, remark, and Professor uh, Kent Kolder, Vice Dean of uh, SICE at Johns Hopkins University, uh, for uh, taking the time out of their busy schedules to give us uh, wonderful welcoming remarks. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Yoon Gyeong Ro and other uh, distinguished speakers uh, and look forward to listening to their talks. Allow me to take this opportunity to thank SAIS Korea Studies uh, and Professor uh, James Person, of course, uh, for co-hosting this event and taking such a good care of uh, the logistics. As a matter of fact, this event is the very first fruit of the partnership between uh, SAIS and KDI School that was recently forged. Uh, through a multifaceted cooperation, we hope to enrich uh, the education and research at SAIS Korea Studies program and advance interest in and understanding of the Korean issues here in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is no ordinary academic conference. There will be cool-headed academic presentations and discussions to be sure, but today we also honor the memories of those who fought and sacrificed themselves for the ideas of freedom, justice, and self-determination in such peaceful yet valiant ways 100 years ago. I must confess that my heart swells as I feel the weight of the moment, as I try to imagine their sufferings and desperation, their hopes and aspiration, and their struggles and determination. As a lowly economist, I don't dare to engage in a scholarly discourse on the historical significance of uh, the March 1st movement in front of many distinguished scholars of history. Allow me, however, to say a few words about why I think it is important to recall and reflect upon this movement at this time and place. I believe that the motivations and ideals that led people to take to the streets, confronting the guns and swords of the oppressors, only with waving Taegeuki flags and shouting, long live. Korean independence still resonate with us today and continue to be a source of inspiration for our own struggle for a better world. Above all, our ancestors rose up to reject domination by others and defend their own dignity. Human dignity, an innate desire of all human beings, 
requires absence of domination by others. And as I have recently learned from uh, Philippe Petit, who was one of the speakers at a uh, uh, conference organized by Professor Park Myung Nim uh, uh, recently in Seoul, the essence of republicanism is prevention of all forms of domination, private as well as public. We are far from realizing this ideal, and the search for better institutional designs is now being confounded by recent technological transformations that have enabled new ways of public and private domination. Secondly, the March 1st movement marked a decisive break with the long tradition of monarchy in Korea. The provisional government established in Shanghai in the wake of the movement declared that Korea would be a democratic republic. Ever since, Koreans have been struggling for democracy, finding pathways toward a fuller and more effective version. Thirdly, uh, the movement was very much a struggle for economic justice. And this aspect deserves more attention than it has had. The records show that almost 60% of those arrested in connection with the movement were peasants, uh, mostly landless sharecroppers, whose legal rights and economic security were severely threatened under the Japanese rule. Uh, for these peasants, shouting for national independence was not so much a political movement as a protest against their uh, economic uh, deprivation. Indeed, the protests by the sharecroppers continued and proliferated well into the 1930s. Uh, the fight for economic just, justice remains a central issue in Korea today. Finally, and per perhaps most importantly, the March 1st movement was a fight for self-determination and national liberation. As such, it was a watershed moment in the history of the Korean resistance to the Japanese occupation and at the same time, an important part of, uh, as uh, uh, Professor, Professor Calder noted, uh, uh, a broader rise of anti-colonial nationalism in the early 20th century, and specifically the singular anti-colonial upsurge of the spring of 1919, which was described as the worldwide movement for reform in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, that reform movement was inspired, of course, by the Wilsonian principle of self-determination and its vision of liberal internationalism uh, put forward as cornerstones of a new international order in the wake of World War I. However, the betrayal of Wilson's promises and the utter failures of the uh, Paris Peace Conference led eventually to World War II, and only after uh, its unspeakable horrors, self-determination and liberal internationalism came to rule the day. Today, however, liberal internationalism is under attack once again, awaiting for our wisdom and political will in its defense. For all these reasons, the March 1st movement is still a source of inspiration to us. In particular, I'd like to emphasize this international aspect as we are gathered here at the heart of Washington, D.C. The failure of the Hanoi summit between Trump and Kim reminds us of the inescapable entanglement of modern Korea with the United States and the crucial role the U.S. must play in bringing about lasting peace in Korea. We expect the U.S. to do much more than that, in fact, and become a guardian of liberal and just internationalism for the entire world. Both peace and self-determination in Korea and liberal internationalism in the world depend so much on the goodwill in this city. Since the days of the March 1st movement, the U.S. has been a beacon of hope in the dark days and a hegemonic leader in the better days, although marked by episodes of betrayals and disappointments. And as our ancestors did 100 years ago, we plead to the better angels in Washington to come forward and live up to their own ideas. 
while there have been hundreds of events commemorating the March 1st movement around the world, and many more are to come, I can't emphasize enough the importance of today's event. Once again, I'd like to thank all the speakers, the guests, and the organizers, and wish a very successful day for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dean Yu, for wonderful remarks. Uh, and thank also um, Ambassador Cho and, and uh, Dr. Calder. Um, I speak not only for myself, but, but also for uh, SAIS students, Korea SAIS concentrators and minors, uh, many of whom volunteered today to help uh, organize this event. When I, when I say that there's a real sense of excitement about this new partnership with KDI, um, we're very excited about this and, and the opportunities that it will, it will bring to the Korea Studies community here. Um, I'd now like to uh, ask Dr. Dr. Lim, uh, Vice Dean Lim, to, to come up and uh, we'll get started with the first panel. Hi, uh, my name is Won Hyuk Lim. I serve as uh, Associate Dean at KDI School and I'm honored to chair this session on the uh, international context of uh, March 1st movement in Korea. March 1st movement uh, is not a well-known event in the United States. It's probably known only to uh, specialists, uh, but it heralded the uh, birth of modern Korea as a democratic republic. And as uh, Ambassador Joe and Dean Yu said, uh, massive, massive demonstrations took place in the month of March and beyond in 1919. And you might ask, how was that possible? Uh, of course, there was uh, underlying discontent, uh, but there was uh, also a lot of organizational work and some catalytic events as well. Uh, as for underlying, uh, underlying discontent, uh, two words that pop up uh, the most in, uh, in Japanese uh, military police's reports after the event uh, were discrimination and contempt. You know, there was a sense of uh, being discriminated against and also uh, being dealt with uh, contempt uh, by the Japanese uh, colonial authorities uh, felt by Korean people. Uh, and as uh, Dean Yu emphasized, uh, there was also a sense of uh, economic grievance, especially among peasants. Uh, but it's one thing to have underlying discontent, but quite another to organize uh, this discontent into some possible political action. And it took religious leaders and student leaders uh, who crossed the uh, regional boundaries, religious boundaries, to organize uh, massive demonstrations to fight for the restoration of uh, Korea's sovereignty. Okay. Uh, and uh, in the second session, when we look at the, uh, the historical context of Korea's uh, March 1st movement and its significance for Korea today, uh, Professor Kim Jong-in would have a lot more to say about this, the uh, organizational work done by religious leaders and student leaders in the name of solidarity. Uh, there were also a couple of catalytic events that led to the March 1st movement. The first was a uh, suspicious death of Emperor Gojong, uh, the last emperor of the Korean em uh, Empire. Uh, the rumor was that he might have been uh, poisoned, and uh, it really uh, galvanized uh, common people to uh, pay respect, final respects to the last emperor, and to also call for the restor restoration of Korean sovereignty. The other uh, catalytic event or catalyst in, in this case was the idea or the principle of national self-determination. As you know, uh, you know, Vladimir Lenin had also talked about uh, self-determination to uh, try and persuade uh, uh, people to uh, uh, stage communist revolution. Uh, but uh, as, you, uh, as you are well aware, uh, President Woodrow Wilson uh, was really the one who called for the uh, Federation of Democratic States and also tried to uh, push ahead with the idea of national self-determination. Uh, in fact, uh, that uh, 
idea, the so, uh, principle of self-determination had a direct link uh, uh, to uh, the March 1st movement because uh, one of the uh, wealth sup wealthy supporters of uh, President Woodrow Wilson, Charles Crane is his name, um, uh, and he later served as ambassador to uh, China. Um, he came to uh, Shanghai to give a talk on the principle of self-determination and uh, to support the Chinese, uh, the idea of sending a delegation to uh, 1919 Paris Peace Treaty. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> a few uh, Korean uh, people went to see Charles C uh, Crane's speech, and one of them was uh, Liao Wun Hyung, uh, one of the leaders of Korea's uh, 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 movement to uh, restore uh, Korea's national sovereignty. And uh, he was inspired by the speech. He later met with uh, Charles Crane, and uh, he realized that it would be a good idea to cite uh, President Woodrow Wilson's uh, principle of self-determination to make a case for Korea. So uh, Liao Eun-hyung then recruited uh, Kim Gyu-sik, who was then a uh, leader of the Christian community in Korea, uh, and uh, tried to send him uh, to uh, uh, Paris for the peace conference. Uh, uh, and it was, uh, it was uh, with some support from uh, the Chinese uh, government at the time, because uh, in a Sun Mun uh, made arrangements so that Kim Gyu Shik could get a passport and also get on the boat, get on the ship to go to Paris conference. Uh, it's there where Kim Gyu Shik made a case for Korea and sent a letter to uh, people like Lloyd George, representing uh, Britain at the time, uh, calling for uh, the uh, recognition of the Democratic, uh, uh, Democratic Republic, the, the Republic of Korea. And uh, interesting thing was Kim Gyu Sik thought uh, if, you, uh, if, if he just goes to the peace conference as so-called a uh, delegate from Korea, uh, other uh, representatives from other countries are not going to give him much credit. I mean, where's the evidence uh, that uh, the Korean people really want uh, the restoration of sovereignty and a uh, democratic republic and so on. So before leaving, Kim gyu Shik had told Liao eun hyung that it would be a good idea to have actual massive demonstrations calling for Korea's uh, restoration of sovereignty. And in fact, that led to uh, February 8th uh, declaration of independence by Korean students in Tokyo and later to the March 1st movement in Korea itself. Uh, while in Paris, uh, Kim gyu Shik uh, communicated with uh, a lot of other leaders from other countries who, who were also trying to cite the principle of self-determination to make a case for their own countries. And in fact, one of them was uh, Ho Chi Minh, uh, who was in Paris to make a case for Vietnam. Now, you could imagine that it would be practically difficult to uh, apply the principle of national self-determination to the colonies occupied by the victors of World War I. Right? And that's where you know, some people uh, talk about the uh, betrayal of uh, Versailles, betrayal of uh, Wilsonian uh, ideal, and so on. But at the same time, as uh, Dean Yu uh, mentioned, uh, he did sow the seed for national self-determination which later was uh, uh, incorporated into the United Nations uh, Charter. So that uh, sums up my uh, introduction to uh, this session. And for this session, we have uh, three distinguished uh, speakers. You can refer to the uh, bio in the uh, handout you got. Uh, first speaker uh, we have is uh, Professor Pang Myung Nim. Uh, he's a professor at Yonsei University and also serves as a director of the Kim Dae Jung Presidential Library in Seoul. Second speaker is uh, Professor uh, Greg Brzezinski, a uh, professor at uh, George Washington University. And finally, the third speaker is uh, Professor Edward McCord, uh, who's also a professor at uh, George Washington University. So without further ado, I'd like to first call on uh, Professor Park to uh, give her a presentation. You have about 20 minutes. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Rim. Uh, due to save our time, I'd like to start <laughs> directly uh, the chart of uh, my PPT presentation. Okay, 
Uh, first of all, I'm really honored to be here as a, a present, presenter <coughs> for commemorating the woman, centennial anniversary of the March 1st movement and also the uh, okay, Paris Peace uh, Conference. Uh, the title, A Global Civil Peace Movement, uh, is, I think, uh, that's the uh, epitome of the uh, March 1st movement and also the Paris Peace uh, Conference of the same year, at the time, uh, the Korean people, they tried to achieve uh, some sort of a Republican federal peace in East Asia and also in the world. Uh, that's the uh, point of my presentation of today. Then why Republican federal peace again? Why global civil uh, peace again? The true meaning of 1918 and 19. I think at the end of the world, world War I, the first European civil war, and also the year of the uh, dual possibility came after the end of the World War I. Peace on the world and autonomy in the local level. Okay. This kind of world possibility has been the first time in the era of modern world history. Global possibility and local possibility as well. Uprising and eruption of so many, it is kind of global, local, yes, movement. Basmasi, Korea, Ireland, India, Turkey, Egypt, China, Estonia, Ukraine, Finland, Latvia, Poland, Georgia, Azerbaijan. How can you understand this kind of worldwide eruptions of distant, but so simultaneous, okay, movement from below? This is a really surprising thing. The more surprising thing is the next one, the quick disappearance, this kind of dual possibility, global possibility and local possibility really quickly disappeared. Rise of Bolshevism, rise of Japanese militarism, Italian fascism, and with German Nazism. This is the map of global local movement in 1919. From Ireland to Korea, worldwide, okay, uh, eruption. Like this. And then, on the Korean Peninsula, this is one of the global movement global, okay, eruption, also so nationwide. Then how to understand, from minus to Korea, they are the local citizens and also the global citizens in the respective country. Without the wide opening of the global level, then how could you imagine that kind of so many local uprisings from below. We cannot separate these two things, two levels, two dimensions, the local level and global level. This is the, the comparison. Recently, the National Competition Committee of History, they released a new okay, statistics of the uh, March 1st movement. So it's so a shock. The total number of uprising, the total number of participants, Total number of casualties really small than the past, okay, statistics. So I think it would be very controversial in the future history in Korea. Then why should I interpret the March 1st movement from the global civil belt frigo level? These are the three, uh, traditional three key natures anti japanese movement, nationalist movement, independent movement. Is it true? Just half true. Half true means, logically speaking, half false. Then we need definitely the new paradigm. This is so anachronistic and parochial. Yes, black and white approach. Black and white dichotomy. One-to-one -one lens. Korea to Japan competition only, epitome of the modern nationalism, victim ment mentality, 
than unchained compulsion or obsession, so-called Zhuang, collective mentality of Korean people, and this collective trauma. How can you cut up that kind of unchained uh, collective mentality of trauma without cutting up this kind of collective trauma, then we cannot subjectify our, ourselves. We cannot humanize ourselves. Or inter-mutual humanization with Japan and with the world. The current Korean constitution, okay, in the preamble they argue, so-called the state sword, scepter or state seal, succession, orthodox of the Republic of Korea, trace back to the okay, Korean provisional government. Can you accept this kind of so, okay, anachronistic juxtaposition? No one country of democratic republic did not use that kind of so anachronistic scepter concept or succession. Also, this is so religious. Because not the uh, legal, not the republican, not the uh, democratic. This is only monarchical and religious, like orthodox tradition we can use. Then I think we need to establish a new paradigm. This is not at all not the independence movement. The restoration of the sovereign, restoration of the existed, so long existed independence so-called restoration in Korean Gwangbok, firstly used right after the Hideyoshi invasion of Korea. Let's imagine the other cases. In Spain, Sorong, after the Sorong, okay, conquista, they only used reconquista, not in independence. In Italy, not in only resurgement. Even in France, they did use it all. As a long history country, Pakistan, not independence movement, not independence struggle at all. Same in China, same in Finland. How about Korea? Long last sovereign state. Same with the, those uh, cases. So, uh, Theoretically speaking, we cannot use the national independence movement, independence struggle, independence, independence hall, restoration hall, restoration movement like the, the resurgement cases. Then I think we need to abolish okay, the concept of independence or independence movement rather than we we try to use the concept of restoration, the instigation of the uh, former sovereign movement. That's the point of the March 1st declaration. They didn't use the independence declaration, just declaration. We declare we already the independent country. That's the first sentence of the March 1st declaration. They didn't use at all the independence concept from that time, okay. I'd like to skip the okay independence gate, Dongnimun independence hall, independence from China later quickly change independence from Japan. Okay, independence through independence move and quickly change independence from all imperialism. After the uh, establishment of the Republic of Korea, they knew these things. At first, they tried to establish the National Day of Independence, but within several months, they changed National Day of Restoration. Then, first of all, yes, as Dean Yu jong il said, to establish some of the Korean provisional government. How can we interpret, explain these things? Yes, we know. 
start of the yes, democratic republican form of government. Also, this has been the all-inclusive entity among the all social movement group, modernization group, maximum coalitional government ever, first ever in the whole Korean history. Now we divide it and also we separate even in South Korea, but only in the Korean provincial government, all traditionalist, nationalist, conservative, conservatives, modernist, Christians, radicals, they gathered under the umbrella of Korean provisional government. Secondly, mea culpa, nostra culpa. Surprisingly, in the March 1st declaration, they did not blame repute at all. Japanese government general and Japanese imperialism. But they repent themselves as General Lee Sun Shin, An Jung Gun, Lee Seong Yong, Min Young Wan. They did not blame Japan. But under the philosophy of mea culpa and nostra culpa, they repent themselves much more than the blaming Japan. Same in the March 1st. Uh, declaration not confined by the boundary of Korean citizen, Korean national citizen, going beyond the wide range of the world citizen. Thirdly, universal peace, non-violence movement, we know so well. The surprising thing is, during the two months nationwide uprising, we could not find so -called, some sort of violent attack were killing Japanese people. Almost perfect peace, almost absolute peace. We could find, try to embrace the Japanese people, even living in the uh, Korean Peninsula. First, they tried to establish the East Asian peace community. Through mutual sovereignty, okay, to recognize the Japanese sovereignty not accepted at all, the Japanese imperialism and militarism as a cosmopolitan ethics, cosmopolitan responsibility, and morality. Korea-Japanese peace relationship and East Asian peace and going beyond the utmost level of the global peace. Why we need to uh, reinterpolate that kind of philosophy, movement, global citizen ethics. Refugees now going in the okay, numbers of the World War II. Most ever in the world, like this. Refugee population going bigger and bigger. We know the name of the victim, the child. Then, global inequality, worst ever in the world history. Then, I think, running from those kind of global civil moments, I think we can run some lessons and legacies okay, going forward from this kind of okay, current stalemate under the liberal peace moment of now. I think there have been four critical moments of transformation in Korea. 1876, moment of modernity, transforming toward modernity, nationality, and sovereignty. 1990, moment of democratic republic, world citizen, universal peace. 1948, moment of world ideological polarization, world division, liberal capitalist movement in South Korea, radical socialist movement of modernity in North Korea. 1987, moment of liberal democracy. 1.3, in North Korea, 
there have been no moment of Republican moment, Republican one, Democrat one, liberal one in North Korea. We are under the acute crisis of the World War, World, World War III. In the case of exploding the North Korea's nuclear crisis, did it stay yet? Korean Peninsula would be balkanized. There have been two uh, times of balkanized. But after the March 1st movement, they showed us. They showed us. Okay. Maximum coalition, and as a world citizen, to embrace the enemy and how to establish the uh, East Asian and world peace together. But after that time, the Korean people divided into the okay, nationalist group and radical, radical and communist group, still lasting division, lasting conflict. Without establishing a domestic coalition, domestic coalitional republic, as I said just before, we cannot achieve any kind of external peace. Domestic coalition is the prerequisite, necessary condition of the external peace, external coexistence. I'm sorry, due to the time limitation, I'd like to skip up this kind of theoretical okay, summarization of the world history. Conflict between okay, domestic model and external model, stasis model or polymorphous model. This, I'm sorry, skip up. But this is the very meaningful statistics showing the whole trajectory of the East Asian region and Korean Peninsula. Let's see the final one. This is very uh, meaningful. Total number of wars in China, Korea, and Japan. Every 11 years, there have been a war in China. Most of them are the civil war or external war. In Japan, every 10.29 years, there has been a war in Japan. Most of them have been civil war. On the Korean Peninsula, why, why must they cope with that kind of victim mentality? Only eight, eight war, I'm, I'm sorry, only every eight, 88 year, there has been a war on the Korean Peninsula one of the longest peace area in the world, in Europe, in Africa, in South Asia, Middle East Asia, America. No one country have shown us this kind of long, long, almost a perpetual peace. Then, Lee Jong Yong said already, Lee Jong Jin said, Shin Chao said, An Jung said many times, 100 years perpetual peace we enjoyed before the Hideyoshi invasion. Isunji many times emphasized we have enjoyed 200 years perfect peace before the Hideyoshi invasion. After the Hideyoshi invasion, Shin Chao said, with the glorious contribution of General Yuzun Shin, we have enjoyed 300 years perfect peace, never war. Between them, and Jung said also, why? How could them? They would enjoy that kind of perfect or perpetual peace, indigenization or localization of the global flows. Sun Byung Yi, he's known. President Woodrow Wilson, he never used the term of self-determination in the important point address. 1918, yeah. He never used. But the representative Korean national 
foreign people, they interpreted this. Oh, we know. He never used the self-determination concept. Word, never. They tried to indianize, localize, under current condition. Iranian, which I'd like to finalize. <coughs> this is the witness, the authentic text, never used. Later, he used self government, self determination, just one time, to address in the Congress. Iranian, it's a fake slogan. Please see this authentic wording of Vladimir Iranian. What does it mean? National liberation within the okay, species of only under the species of Russian imperialism. Never allow the national sovereignty, never allow national independence. He's also setting wording. He killed every people, Basmash, Georgia, Estonia, Latvia, under the name of national liberation. He killed, he massacred, under the name of national liberation. Yes, then, this is the, okay, what's that is after the World War One. See, please see carefully, centered around Europe, move to Southeast Asia, Cold War period, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, now after the globalization. Okay, quickly listen. Then, I think this is the cases of the Democratic Republic cases for external pairs from the Chi to Austria, Finland. Prove so concretely. Then, okay, sorry, I, I miscalculated the presentation time. So prepared a little longer. Yeah, here. With the real rise of China, how to establish the peace on the Korean Peninsula and East Asia and the world? I think we must learn from the widest opening era of the humankind right after the World War I. Okay? Like it is. After the US China deployment normalization, there has been no major war on the Pacific area. But Japanese American relations, Soviet U USSR USA relations, there have been so many wars. Very interesting. Mao Zedong, after the long march, he said already the rags of tripartite peace. For the perpetual peace of the world, we must divide the world into three parts, like this. USA, China, and European Union has envisioned the two generations later world order. But before Mao Zedong, An jung -un and March First Movement leaders, they already have envisioned like this. An jung -un is, is the key president of March First Declaration, March First Movement philosophy and language. He, he gave us the idea of East Asian Peace Council. Council means assembly or union at the time. Through East Asian Peace Council, among Japan, China, and Korea, we will achieve the perpetual peace and happiness, quote unquote, his wording. Connect the East Asian Peace Council as a Republican federal with the perpetual peace scheme with the world. Like this. This is Anjungun's idea of universal peace and much more movement readers. They accepted Anjungun's vision, like this, with the common currency, common education, common military, common bank, and common language. Let's compare this kind of common tool with the Constitution of the United States, the founding fathers' philosophy 
and the constitution of European Union. 100 years ago, okay, An Jung-kun and the readers of March Post Moon taught us this kind of three-level approach to global civil peace scheme, Korean, East Asian, and global level uh, world peace. I'm sorry to escape so many charts. Thank you for your so much. Now, Professor uh, Brzezinski will give a, a talk on Wilson's 14 points, and it's... Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, thank you for, um, it's, it's a great uh, honor to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Sice, and I'd like to thank um, James Person, who I can proudly say uh, is a former PhD student of mine, uh, for inviting me here uh, to talk at this event. Um, I, I fear that after Pac, uh, Professor Pak just spoke against uh, the victim mentality in Korea, uh, my presentation is actually going to help uh, re-inspire uh, the victim mentality to some degree, uh, because I'm going to talk about why the United States didn't support the Korean independence movement. Uh, as um, uh, Professor Lim was uh, saying, uh, the, the United States may have inspired the movement in some ways, but it didn't support it. And why not? And I think to understand this, you have to start by looking at American policy towards Japan and East Asia more broadly uh, it, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, especially around 1905 when the Ursa Treaty, which made Korea a Japanese protectorate officially, was signed. And I think one of the most basic reasons that the United States doesn't feel any compulsion to protect Korea against Japanese colonialism is because the United States itself is an imperialist power at the time. A lot of people forget because when we talk about the Cold War, we talk about the American empire and we're really talking about a very informal kind of empire that the United States had in its client states. But at the turn of the century, the United States had just acquired a formal empire. It had defeated Spain in the Spanish-American War and established itself as an empire in the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam. Theodore Roosevelt, the president at the time of the Ursa Treaty, was himself one of the staunchest supporters of imperialism among American presidents. He supported imperialism around the world many of his predecessors had had this idea that the United States should try to distinguish itself from European colonialism by not acquiring the same kind of empires that the Europeans did. Theodore Roosevelt did not believe this at all. He praised the American empire in the Philippines. He praised the British empire in Egypt. He believed that these empires were spreading civilization and, uh, and bearing the white man's burden, a phrase that uh, of course comes from Kipling, but Roosevelt liked to use it as well. Roosevelt himself, when asked about why the United States was uh, allowing Japanese colonialism in Korea, he said that it was out of the question that any nation without any interest of its own at stake would attempt to do for the Koreans what they were unable to do for themselves. And this was solidified. This attitude becomes solidified somewhat in what's called the Taft Katsura Agreement. Now, a lot of nitpicky people will say it wasn't an agreement, it wasn't an agreement, they never signed an agreement. Um, I, you know, I think it, 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 there was no signed agreement, but there was an informal agreement based on a discussion that uh, occurred between uh, William Howard Taft and uh, his Japanese counterpart in 1905. And this discussion basically uh, reflected an attempt on the part of the United States to reach a modus vivendi 
with Japan in the Pacific. They realized that Japan was a growing Pacific power at the time. Theodore Roosevelt was perfectly content with allowing Japan to establish an empire in Korea. What the United States was worried about first and foremost was its own empire in the Philippines. So they basically came up with this agreement in 1905 in which Taft recognized that a Japanese protectorate over Korea would be beneficial while Japan uh, claimed that it would harbor no aggressive designs on the Philippines. This would of course be disproven uh, 30 some years later uh, during World War II. Uh, but nonetheless, at the time, the uh, preeminent policy of the United States was to seek to find an accommodation with growing Japanese power. And a lot of the racial attitudes uh, that Theodore Roosevelt expressed that led him to support Japanese colonialism also informed American views of Korea up until the uh, March 1st movement and at the time of the March 1st movement. Uh, there was especially a very uh, vile racism in the uh, rhetoric that many Americans used when they spoke about Korean. This is George Kennan. He's not George F. Kennan, who is the uh, originator and author of the famous long telegram that helped to uh, give birth to the idea of containment. He's actually a cousin of George F. Kennan, but he was himself a very distinguished Asia and Russia specialist. Uh, he actually published a, a widely circulated uh, article about Korea that called Koreans dirty, lazy, and dishonest. And this kind of uh, racist view of Koreans was very uh, prevalent in the United States and in the State Department at the time. Uh, similar views were expressed by the US ambassador to Japan. And you could see there was this sort of admiration for Japan among some American officials as a modernizing force, a liberalizing force in Asia. Uh, but at the same time, they really bought into what the Japanese were telling them about the Koreans. So here's uh, Ambassador Roland Morris, who said that there was no comparison between the well-ordered Japanese regime and the corrupt personal government of the Korean throne. And again, this was a common trope in American discourse about Korea at, during, uh, at, at around the time of the March 1st movement, this idea that Koreans were incapable of governing themselves and that they really uh, just uh, you know, uh, deserve to be uh, victims of Japanese colonialism. And then there was also, um, you know, by the time World War, N, World War I ends, Woodrow Wilson, of course, travels to Versailles and uh, plays, becomes one of the major players in drafting the Versailles Treaty. But Wilson has some very complicated issues that are going on in U.S. relations with Japan at the time. One issue was the issue of Japanese immigration to the United States. Uh, there was a uh, surge of Japanese immigrants to the West Coast in the late 19th and early 20th century. This had actually led to anti-Japanese riots uh, at the turn of the century. And so uh, the, uh, the United States, uh, the, the State Department and American officials were trying to actually limit Japanese immigration to the United States because of uh, anti-Japanese racism, racism on the West Coast. And so uh, Wilson had this idea that you know, one of Japan's problems was that its country was too small for it. And he said this at the Versailles Conference. He said the Japanese country was too small for them, and even Korea and Manchuria were not enough. So Wilson was really looking to Korea and China and Manchuria as places that could absorb 
excess Japanese population, so it went into Asia instead of going to the United States and the West Coast. Uh, another delicate issue that came up at the Versailles Conference was Japan's racial equality amendment. This was an interesting point. Japan viewed itself as being superior and fit to govern over Manchuria and Korea, but at the same time, even when it endorsed that kind of racism, it didn't like Western racism. It wanted Japan to be considered the equal of the Western powers. So at the Versailles Conference, Japan actually proposes what comes to be known as the Racial Equality Amendment, but Wilson and the State Department are very afraid of this. Robert Lansing, the Secretary of State, worries that if this amendment is passed, it would raise the race issue throughout the world. And so Wilson already angered Japan by opposing the Racial Equality Amendment. So he knew that if he also tried to do anything about the creation of a Japanese empire in Korea, or not the creation, at this point the perpetuation of the Japanese empire in Korea, he would only alienate the Japanese even further than he already uh, what had. And so this, uh, this also was one of the reasons uh, uh, Wilson was uh, so hesitant to speak out on behalf of, uh, you know, not, not just Korean independence movements, but other independence movements. Professor uh, Park had mentioned that the Koreans were not the only uh, uh, colonized society that sent delegations to the March, uh, to the Versailles Conference. There were actually a number of them, and they were almost all uh, ignored by the powers there. Another fear that Wilson had was a fear of Russian Bolshevism and Lenin. The 14 points themselves had been aimed in part at countering the growing global influence of Lenin. Wilson tended to see all Korean nationalists as communists, and this was part of the problem. And at the time, the U.S. was actually supporting a Japanese intervention in Siberia that was geared at helping the white army against the Bolsheviks. The United States, Wilson and Secretary of State Lansing feared that if you supported the Korean independence movement, you would actually end up helping the Bolsheviks. Lansing said that uh, the, the Bolsheviks would gain a foothold in Manchuria and cooperate with the Korean revolutionists there, by which he meant uh, some of the Korean nationalists that had fled to China uh, at the, during the early 20th century. So what actually happens at the Versailles Conference, uh, Dean Lim spoke about this a little bit. Uh, the Koreans eventually dispatch a delegation. Um, Sigmund Rhee was in the United States at the time. He'd actually appealed for a passport so that he could go to Versailles, and Wilson wants nothing to do with this. If you read like some biographies of Sigmund Rhee, they'll say Rhee and Wilson were really close, and when Rhee went to Princeton, they used to sit around and play the piano together. Um, but uh, when, when uh, Rhee tries to get a passport to, to go to the, the Versailles conference, he is ignored. And Kim Kyu-shik's delegation at Versailles is also similarly ignored. Japan is not only allowed to maintain control over Korea, but it also gains control over Shandong province in China, which I, I hope Ed uh, might talk about a little more. Even though Wilson had actually opposed this, he was more sympathetic towards Chinese demands for uh, greater independence than he was toward Korean uh, demands, partially because of the long-held uh, American dream of a China market. Did everyone agree with Wilson in the United States? No. There was actually some opposition. Uh, there were a group of peace progressives, uh, mostly from the Republican Party, uh, if you can imagine that, 
the Republicans were actually the progressives uh, back, at the, back in the early 20th century. Uh, Robert La Follette from Wisconsin was one of the staunchest uh, opponents of the Versailles Treaty, and when it was being debated in the Senate, he actually introduced an amendment to the treaty which guaranteed Egypt, Korea, and other countries imperial, under imperial rule the right of revolution. Uh, eventually, however, uh, both the treaty and the amendments were defeated in the Senate, and of course, uh, Japanese colonialism is, uh, you know, uh, well, the, the treaty would have uh, perpetuated Japanese colonialism in any event, uh, but uh, both the treaty and the amendments are defeated uh, in large part because of domestic debates between Wilson and the Republican opposition to the Versailles Treaty, which was opposed to the treaty not only over issues of colonialism, but also because many didn't like the League of Nations. Uh, they feared it would drag the United States into uh, foreign wars. They'd just been through an unprecedented uh, foreign war, and they didn't want another one. What were the ultimate results of this? I think one of the things that happens not only in Korea, but throughout the world, is you get the radicalization of some groups of Korean nationalists and a disillusionment with Wilson and the United States. Whether Wilson ever said anything about self-determination specifically or not, the fact that his speeches and ideals were actually part of what inspired the March 1st movement, I think, is, is harder, to argument, uh, to, harder to argue with. And so uh, you had disillusionment with Wilson and the United States, and you had ultimately the deeper legitima uh, legitimization of Japanese colonialism, not only in Korea, but o in, in other parts of the world. And I would argue that this was ultimately American policy in 1919 was ultimately a tragedy because America's failure to support Korean independence more strongly in 1919 would make America's role on, on the Korean Peninsula much more difficult, much more complicated, and create a political environment which was very different from what it might have been had Wilson and the United States supported the Korean independence movement. Uh, I will end there. Thank you very much. I don't have PowerPoint, so. <laughs> Okay, my, my charge was to put the uh, March 1st movement in the kind of a global context by looking at uh, the May 4th movement in China. And I'm a China expert, so I can't uh, uh, say that I have much expertise on Korea at all. Um, this movement, the May 4th movement in China, was named after a demonstration that occurred in China on May 4th, 1919, really in anger over the results of the Versailles Peace Conference and the way China was treated. Um, and actually, we have lots of debates inside the China field about what the meaning of this movement is. But in essence, you can see it at its very roots, a movement for, to defend Chinese national sovereignty. And therefore, I think it really fits into Professor Pak's explanation about the restoration of sovereignty as the thing that unified a uh, kind of worldwide movement at this time. And China fits into that, even if it doesn't fit into an, uh, a worldwide independence movement because China uh, wasn't, it didn't have a problem of independence. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk to. And so I'm trying to decide what I should talk about today. I was concerned about how I could make some points of comparison. First, I was just going to stress similarities across Ch with China's uh, May 4th movement and the, Korea, and the Korean movement or other movements. And, but I also was troubled by this because there's also a lot of uh, differences. It's not just similarities, but there's also differences. So I thought probably emphasize a bit more of the differences to start with. Um, but in, in looking at this, I was somewhat inspired by the work of Xu Guoqi, who's written, I think, probably the best book on China in World War I, called China and the Great War. And one of his great insights was this, I'll just read this insight that I got from him. China's interest in the war developed out of a sense of victimization. Yet, the very imperialist forces that humiliated China also served as inspiration. The Chinese sought to defeat imperialism by adopting imperialist motivation and ideology. The new ideology of nationalism fueling China's revolution 
internal renewal and transformation was based on the Chinese desire to join the world to become a modern nation state and a strong and powerful country. And so I think this is really important because it shows, um, it reminds us really that these movements in 1919 were not just anti-imperialist movements, it's what we tend to look at in the Chinese case. We look at the, uh, it's all we look at really in some ways is an anti-imperialist movement. Um, but it's combined with nation building goals. It's not just about opposing imperialism, but also building the nation. And I think you see that very well, maybe even better in the March, March 1st movement, because it's not just anti-Japanese imperialism, but also calling for the creation of a Korean Republic. And so there's, you have this two-sided goals that are incorporated in all these 1919 movements, I think. Um, but this, this dichotomy between anti-imperialism and nation building is much more complicated in the Chinese case. Uh, because of the nature of what kind of impact imperialism had on China. Um, now, there's certainly no doubt that China saw itself as the victim of imperialism. Um, and you see that mainly as the result of a whole series of war that starts with the Opium War in the 1840s and then through the Sino-Japanese War in 1894-95, um, where China was accept, forced to accept all sorts of the, what they eventually called the unequal treaties. Um, and it, it called unequal treaties largely because they were violations of Chinese sovereignty. So again, that idea of the restoration of sovereignty. Um, so this included sessions of territory along the border or places like Hong Kong. It included the establishment of treaty ports where foreigners could trade, but often in those treaty ports you have leased territories to the foreign powers. Inside those, those leased territories, or again, uh, really across all of China, uh, foreign, foreigners and foreign property were outside of Chinese law based on the principle of extraterritoriality. And then following the Sino-Japanese War in 1894-95, you had the creation of spheres of influence where in essence, China gave up a lot of its economic rights, um, its right to develop its own economy so that foreign powers would have predominant interest in certain areas, in certain spheres um, uh, to, to run, run China's economy. And you have this kind of classic cartoon, from, that's one PowerPoint I could have done, that classic mm -hmm. cartoon of the foreign, China screaming in the background, the foreign powers dividing China up like a piece of pie. The Chinese put it in the terms of dividing up a melon, as the more for, it makes more sense for Chinese than pies. But um, is that sense somehow that China was on the verge of being turned into a colony, but it wasn't quite there yet. Um, and so that's why in the Chinese case, what's important is not so much, well it is, it's important what happened to China in terms of imperialism, but also it's important what didn't happen. Um, because China feels the weight of imperialism, but it was never fully colonized. It never became a colony. And so the result is something that we in the, field, in the China field usually call semi-colonialism, which is kind of a halfway to colonialism but not truly there. Um, and so this is very different from other countries such as Korea that actually became colonies of another, of another state. Um, and so where the struggle against imperialism was also a struggle against that, in, that uh, colonial administration inside their own country. So it's not just about establishing a new, like in the Korean case, it's not just to establish a Republic of Korea, but first of all, you have to get rid of the Japanese. Um, so to that extent, China retained its own government. China never was without its own government. Um, and so it was possible in the Chinese case to separate out these, these, this nation building and the anti-imperialism a little bit more. Um, and that also led then to the second, given the existence of the Chinese government, so that goal is already there, the main struggle is not just to throw out foreign administration then, but really to, to demand equal treatment for China as part of the world community. And I think this is the emphasis that, that Xu Guoqi uh, uh, comes to. Um, what was very interesting, I think, about all this is how China perceived itself in this kind of situation it, it found itself in, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, in some ways, the survival of the Qing Dynasty into 1911 may have slowed China's realization of itself as a victim of, of imperialism. Um, and I think if you look at Kirk Larson's work where he shows how before the Sino-Japanese War, uh, the Qing state was trying to apply some of the techniques of imperialism to Korea. Uh, the, the way to reestablish its credentials as its own imperialist power was to treat Korea in a subordinate way. But do it in a way that's, that's modeled after Western imperialism, not of the traditional relationship with Korea. So that's one side of the, this Chinese concept of itself is we already are an independent state with an imperial government. We have to act like an imperialist. On the other hand, this understanding about the impact of imperialism that was actually happening in China on the ground. 
And so Rebecca Carl in this book, of stage, another real excellent book, Staging the World, um, shows how around the turn of the century, more and more Chinese, this is following the sound of Japanese war, begin to see themselves in the same boat as colonized nations, right? That they were also victims of imperialism. And so you begin to see, this is, so before this, the Chinese would never have done this. They begin to compare themselves to countries like Poland, who had just been, Poland was lost. And so they're saying, okay, is this going to happen to us that we're going to become lost? Very concerned then about Korea at some point. Korea is a lost country. Will China also become a lost country? Uh, the Boers in South Africa. So they're beginning to identify themselves in a way with, with subordinate countries, nations, ethnicities, who are having trouble maintaining their, their sovereignty and seeing themselves in that same group of people. We're, we're just like that. So it is a, an interesting, I think, transition where China goes from seeing itself as an empire whose best goal should be to at, behave like an empire, be, behave in perils itself, but also they begin to see itself as a colonized or semi-colonized power. Um, and one thing this did is, is color China's revolutionary movements in this period. Um, so on one hand, clearly the inability of the Qing dynasty to defend China from imperialism and to make all these concessions in these treaties um, was one of, the, one of the reasons behind the 1911 revolution that overthrew the Qing, dynasties, uh, the Qing dynasty. Uh, at the same time, though, the revolution of that period, such as Sun Yat-sen, who, if you actually listen to Sun Yat-sen's speeches in this period, he actually talks about imperialism. I, I remember a very famous talk he gave to Muslims in Beijing about how we should unite with our brothers in the Middle East because we all suffer from imperialism together. So this is in 1912, I think, when he gave that speech. Um, but during the revolution, he doesn't talk about it that way. So the revolutionaries were very careful to say, no, this is a revolution against the Qing dynasty for all of its failures. This is not against imperialism. We're not going to overthrow the unequal treaties. This is purely a domestic matter. Um, and so they were, because they had their own state, and you could direct your, your anger against the state, not against the colonial administration, you were able to separate those two issues out, primarily because they were afraid if it became an anti-imperialist struggle, if the revolution was seen as an anti-imperialist struggle, it would provoke the very thing they're afraid of. It would provoke a foreign intervention that would mean the takeover of China and the loss of their nation. Um, so here we have this very strange situation where even though anti-imperialism was a key factor in China's political movements and revolutionary movements, um, they were able to keep this on separate tracks, so separate concerns. Um, so in the Chinese case, the significance of the May 4th movement is how it brought domestic politics and foreign relations back together again. And this is really what the May 4th movement was all about. Um, the main problem, I think, that we have with our studies of the May 4th movement is, though, its kind of emphasis on opposition, right? Opposition to imperialism, opposition to the Versailles Peace Conference. Um, and it's, again, the, the, the movement itself arose from this demonstration against the, the, the results of the Versailles Peace Conference. Um, and I think that, again, the main contribution of Xu Guoqi's work is to show, remind us actually why China was at Versailles in the first place. And again, it gets back to the idea of restoration of national sovereignty. It wasn't just about we want to show our opposition to imperialism. There's another, a, a broader goal behind this. Um, so China's decision to join the allied powers in declaring war against Germany, which is ver debated in China about what are we doing in Europe anyway, but they did ultimately declare war against Germany, um, was in part anyway a rational look at who they thought was going to win. And if the Germans lost, they could get the German concessions in China back. They're going to do this piecemeal. They get different parts of the concessions back. Um, and so they were able to claim the right to attend the Versailles Peace Conference because they were on the winning side. They were part of the allied forces that fought against Germany. Um, but this attendance at Versailles also had an underlying purpose that's often not given enough attention. And that is their goal at the Versailles Peace Conference was also to gain recognition of China as an equal member of the world community. So it's got this, these two different sides going on at the same time. And that's where Woodrow Wilson inspired them, as we've already heard from some of the other comments, the 14 points, and the assumption that he was in favor of self-determination, even, even if he didn't say it. I mean, he did talk about popular sovereignty in ways that would suggest that. Um, so part of that, of course, is that first goal. They assumed because of that self-determination, popular sovereignty issue, that because they won the war, they would get the German concessions in, in China back. Um, but it also was, they saw an opportunity here at the Versailles Peace Conference to demand the end of unequal treaties. And they were going to make an international law argument that treaties signed under coercion should not be legal. 
right? They should not be legal. And so this is the beginning of a process. We have a continuity in the Chinese diplomatic corps through all the civil wars in, in China in this period. It's the same group of people following the same goals. And there's a very good article by Allison Kaufman in uh, Modern China in 2014 that shows that, that kind of continuity of the, of the Chinese diplomatic corps pursuing these goals of getting recognition for China and overturning unequal treaties from this point on. So this is one of the proposals they were going to make at the League of Nations over and over and over and over. Um, and so they appreciated that, that those Wilsonian concepts that they thought would support uh, any kind of opposition movement against imperialism. And of course, the result for the Chinese, they found all these hopes were dashed. They found out that during the war, Japan had gone around and got the agreement of all the foreign powers, including the United States, to turn over the German concessions of China to Japan. Uh, so this was the first kind of shock. Um, and so what we're told China is that, wait a minute, we're at the Versailles Peace Conference as one of the victors, and we're being treated like one of the defeated powers, right? We're having stuff taken away from us. Even worse, they find out that their, the warlord government in Beijing at that time had also agreed to the, these terms in exchange for, for financial support. And so they felt betrayed by their own government. And then their challenge to unequal treaties was just rejected out of hand, just like the un, uh, racial equality things were rejected out of hand. And this is where, in China anyway, Wilson turns from being a popular hero to a villain. Right, that he betrayed, the Versailles Peace Conference betrayed us, Wilson also betrayed us. Um, and that is what provokes these popular protests in Beijing on May 4th that would sp soon spread over the entire country. Um, so again, the, the significance of these protests though were that they were not just an attack, they were anti-imperialist protests against the Versailles Peace Conference, but also they are an attack on the warlord government that had compromised Chinese sovereignty. So they put these, this movement is attacking warlordism and imperialism at the same time. Uh, and this really becomes, and you, you can put it all together in like one concept of national unity, that this now becomes the main kind of principle of Chinese nationalism from this point, at least in 1949. And we have to get rid of the warlords that divide the country internally. We also have to get rid of imperialism. And no government in China from this point on can actually be opposed to that. They all have to show their credentials in that. And so it's very important for the nationalists when they unify the country in 1926 very important for the communists when they succeed in 1949. Um, but there's also a legacy of the May 4th movement in terms of long-term impact on Chinese foreign relations. Um, China is able then to say, and we still see this today, um, to, to talk about its unity with the colonized countries of the world and the, the suffering countries that have suffered under imperialism and to identify itself with the third world. So this proved very useful for China. The other result of the Versailles Peace Conference, though, was that we give less attention to, is that um, is what the delegates, what the, the diplomatic corps was doing. So the Chinese, most Chinese history is written like this was a disaster. The re it was a defeat for China, disaster, 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 and so the people had to fight against it. Uh, but again, scholars like Xu Guoqi have shown that, that actually the diplomats never gave up. They refused to sign the treaty at Versailles. Um, and they continued to, they all, but they wanted to participate in the League of Nations. They insisted that they participate in the League of Nations, and they took every opportunity to make sure they participated on an equal level. Um, so that there would be, and part of that is a constant propaganda PR campaign they did to assert that China actually not just should be treated as an equal member, but as a great power. And so this, at the time, it's kind of shocking. Um, if you go on based on military power, political influence, and post-World War, World War I period, China was not a great power. So they begin to use other arguments about why China should be recognized as a great power. Uh, the size of its population, size of its territory, its long history, contributions to world culture, and they just hammered this in and in over and over again. And it became part of China's story in, in such a relentless way that ultimately it's actually accepted. We kind of see this in the way that FDR ultimately treats China in World War II, that we have to treat China as a great power because it is a great power, and in the UN it has to be part of the great powers in the UN. It's something that, the, so this is really the result of these diplomats who, on, on top of fighting imperialism, were also at the same time saying, but we also are a great power. We need to be a great power. And so I think there's, the end result for China is this tension between these two different faces that continues on today. So on one hand, China continues to talk about itself periodically as an oppressed uh, semi-colonial, you know, we're recovering from semi-colonialism and we need, for example, that be treated like a developing nation where we get all the privileges of all the other developing nations because we are just along with them in this, this uh, uh, our former struggle against imperialism. On the other hand, China is also trying to, to um, 
reclaim its former dominant influence in East Asia and in the world as part of uh, the China dream, you know, that China will recover its image, uh, its, its status in the past. And in somewhat a strange way, China's current uh, One Road, One Belt campaign merges these two identities. On one hand, it's portrayed as China going out there to help all the other underdeveloped countries that it's part of, right? We're part of this. At the same time, though, it's going to be done in such a way that symbolizes China's greatness. So it's part of China's dream to lead the way and be the dominant power in all this. Um, and so I think there's a, ultimately for China anyway, there's a tension in these two identities between, on one hand, anti-imperialism, and on the other hand, national greatness or na nation building. But I think it goes back to the whole sense of the 1919 legacy itself that's, that's greater than China. And more, I mean, so there's a particular take on that for, in the Chinese case. Um, but so we, you know, we have this kind of anti-imperialist nation building struggle that, that's everywhere in that legacy. So one, one side of this legacy is, of course, that um, one, one face of that legacy is the building of, of modern nation states. You know, this was very important for Chinese establishment of the Chinese national identity and the creation of their modern state, just as the March 1st movement is important for the Korean concept of the state that they are today. Um, but that also has, I mean, if you're going to emphasize national interests and national sovereignty, there is that potential for national conflict, conflict of interest between nations. It doesn't mean you're all going to get together. And so the other side of the 1919 legacy is that it points to ways in which there are actually values also that can be shared out of this experience that might actually produce some kind of hope for um, reconciliation of, of conflicts of international interest. And I like the, the point on uh, the global peace point of the March 1st movement as well. That's, that's part of the values that are somehow embedded in that as well. And that there is some hope that even though we're going to stress national sovereignty, which can lead to international conflict, we also have some way that there are these values that, can, that bring peace uh, uh, through that, uh, that common uh, legacy. Okay, thank you. Okay. It's on? Okay. 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 Well, uh, at the outset, Professor Park uh, emphasized that we need to move on from uh, the old paradigm uh, that sees uh, the March First Movement mainly as anti-imperialist, uh, nationalistic, independence movement, uh, uh, to uh, a new paradigm where he, emph where he em emphasized the uh, uh, more nation-building aspect of the struggle, uh, democratic republic, uh, and. Uh, independence is actually not the right word. He, um, uh, he, uh, he argued that uh, it's more like a, a restoration of sovereignty for many of these states uh, because uh, Korea, uh, like uh, uh, Ireland, India, uh, Egypt, and so on, were not artificial states uh, that were becoming, uh, that were newly being created, uh, uh, newly becoming independent. Uh, and uh, finally, he also shed light on the uh, global peace uh, perspective, uh, something of a federation uh, idea, not only at the domestic level with the coalition politics, but also at the uh, international level. And uh, you know, with, with that, uh, Professor uh, Brzezinski shed some light on the uh, complexities of uh, Woodrow Wilson as a person and also the foreign policy of uh, the United States in the first half of the 20th century. I, I mean, uh, he mentioned uh, taft katura uh, Accord or Agreement, uh, which some of my uh, American friends see as sort of the third rail in U.S.-Korea relations. Uh, there are no eternal friends, no eternal enemies in uh, the dirty business known as uh, international politics. And then uh, he, uh, I thought it was uh, interesting that he emphasized um, the uh, racial attitudes that uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson and other Americans held at the time because, I mean, as is uh, well known, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson segregated civil service, so he had sort of racist attitude, especially toward African Americans. Uh, at the same time, I mean, one, one could add that he did think imperialism, imperialism was a problem. He uh, also allowed for the self-rule of the Philippines under the Jones Act, and uh, he at least tried to make a movement away from imperialism as uh, encapsulated in the uh, mandate system uh, in the League of Nations. But uh, cynics might view a mandate system as just a 
you know, cover for uh, another uh, um, neo-colonialism. So he's a compli uh, complicated figure, and his uh, legacy is uh, is mixed uh, uh, in that uh, in that uh, regard. And I, I thought it was uh, uh, important that he emphasize uh, the point that Wilson uh, basically tended to see nationalists at this time as potential or actual communists, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that trend in U.S. foreign policy goes all the way to Vietnam War, and that's where you know the, the whole thing kind of uh, falls apart. And you know, it, one one uh, is reminded that Ho Chi Minh actually cited Jefferson, uh, Thomas Jefferson, to <laughs> try and you know call for the national liberation of Vietnam and to appeal to the Americans. It was in vain. Uh, uh, and uh, finally, with uh, Professor McCord's uh, uh, illuminating uh, presentation on March 4th movement, uh, once again, he, um, he emphasized that it was not just an anti-imperialist uh, movement, but there was actually an important nation-building uh, component to it. And he linked the, uh, the, the legacy of the March, uh, or the May 4th movement to the present-day uh, Chinese foreign policy that sees uh, China as sort of a representative of a developing country, uh, a formerly non-aligned movement, and so on. But at the same time, China demands increasingly that it is uh, uh, accorded the status as a great power, uh, if not one of the two or even uh, the dominant uh, uh, power uh, in the world. So I thought that was very uh, very insightful as well. Now, we have about uh, 15 minutes left uh, till uh, 12 noon, uh, and I'd like to uh, invite some questions and uh, comments from the floor. So if you could identify yourself and uh, make your point uh, succinctly, I would appreciate it. Yes, right, first. Uh, Michael Mosetic, I'm a journalist, but also an adjunct here at the site. I wanted to connect one comment uh, that we'll probably get into in the afternoon panel, that the, uh, the March movement did lead to divisions among Koreans that perpetuated up to today. I guess we'll get into that later. But with the two Americans here, the because most of us absorbed in American diplomatic history think of the division of Korea with Dean Rusk and his colleagues looking at a National Geographic map and sort of throwing a dart at the 38th parallel. Uh, could you sort of blend these two things uh, together for us to the extent to which how much the division of, of Korea was a result of post Potsdam and how much goes all the way back to March? And you had your hands up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think you should make your point and we'll. Just very briefly, um, of course, uh, some of the discussion, most of the discussion dealt with in the theme of our conference, March 1st, but also uh, Professor McCord was talking about May 4th, and, and just two months later, and uh, I certainly appreciate that the major stimulus was uh, Versailles and what was happening over in Versailles. But I wonder how conscious the Chinese themselves were of March 1st and what they thought of March 1st. Okay. So, yeah, and James? Uh, uh, my question is for uh, uh, Greg, for Professor Brzezinski. Um, you mentioned, um, of course, that American officials American um, policymakers had these uh, views toward the Koreans that they were incapable of, of ruling themselves, but that wasn't necessarily the the view on the ground among missionaries. For example, um, we we have among the documents that uh, I, I now I the British documents I found, but I, I should give credit to my friend uh, uh, Bowen Che who found the U.S. documents um, uh, for me, um, uh, but. These include a lot of letters from missionaries in Korea who are sending these to their friends at the State Department um, describing the events on the ground in, in, in 1919. Could you just talk a little bit about the, the efforts of, of the missionaries to 
um, change perspectives in Washington? Okay. Th those are the three questions we'll tackle first, and then uh, we do the next round. Of that. Okay, um, I, can I, um, I'd, I'd like to speak um, also to the, the first question that the, that the gentleman raised. Um, you know, the, does the division go back to March 1st, and, you know, how does the uh, decision to divide the Korea in 1945 overlap onto that? And I, I think, you know, there's, uh, there are internal divisions within Korea that do go back to 1919, uh, absolutely. Uh, but, you know, what's sort of interesting is that the, the, the 1945 division was sort of uh, irrelevant to those in some ways. A, a lot of people say that if, uh, you know, the Americans and Soviets had any brains, uh, the Americans would have occupied the North and the Soviets would have occupied the South uh, because the South was more agricultural uh, and so it was a more natural hotbed of sort of peasant uh, revolution and the North was more industrialized, so more of the capitalists uh, were in the North. Uh, and so it's not, it's not completely uh, the case, but I, I do think that, um, you know, you, you can make an argument that the, the Cold War division of the peninsula and, of course, the subsequent war that follows uh, takes place at the expense of a civil conflict that was brewing uh, throughout the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, James's point, uh, I, I think, is, is uh, true uh, to, to a degree. Certainly the missionaries on the ground in Korea were more hostile towards Japanese colonialism. Uh, I think they had a couple of problems. One was that uh, the Japanese imperialists, you know, uh, they eventually reached a point where they said, uh, if you keep propagandizing against us, you're going back. Uh, and so, um, you know, eventually they had to stop. And I, I do think if you look at some missionary journals into the, the 20s and 30s, uh, the, the, the analysis of Korea becomes a little bit more complex. Uh, there's certainly still, uh, and, and to some degree it, it varies, like if you go to one missionary archive, like this mission had one view, uh, and other missionary archives have another view, um, and you know, because there's like, you know, Presbyterians and uh, Baptists and all different, uh, you know, groups that, that become involved uh, in the peninsula. Uh, but um, uh, I, I think some of the, 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 there, there are also some missionary journals I've seen from the mid and, and late 20s where they're actually praising uh, Japanese colonialism as sort of a modernizing force. Um, but I, I do agree, though, that on the ground uh, in 1919, 1920, there, there were a lot of uh, missionaries that were quite courageous in their opposition to Japanese colonialism, and some remain that way throughout the colonial period. Uh, I think if you want to look at why Christianity uh, has as much stronger hold in South Korea than it does in Japan or Taiwan, uh, that's actually a very important part of the story. You, you had a question. Yeah, so about, much. Yeah. Answer the question about what did the Chinese think about the March 1st movement. I, I have to preface that by saying I think there's a flaw in the Chinese histori history field in that it's very self-centered. Uh, very, it looks into its own navel only and doesn't look outward. This was part of a problem that even when I began to be a graduate student, they were talking about we needed to do, old Chinese history used to be all, all about foreign relations and what the missionaries were doing and what the foreign powers were doing. And so we did this turn towards um, China-centered history. And so if we look at the May 4th movement in particular, almost all the work up to this point was about the, the demonstrations in China what the demonstrations are all about, what the Chinese people thought about this demonstration, what they thought about imperialism, very internal. Mm -hmm. a, and almost no mention even of Versailles. So Versailles is like the thing that sparks it. You get that done in the first paragraph, and then you talk about everything else. And so this book by Xu uh, Guoqi is like the first one to really say, let's look at real, what happened at Versailles. Mm -hmm. Let's go back and look at China's foreign relations. Mm -hmm. And I think what we'll discover is that these things did have an impact, that the March 1st in, uh, movement had a major impact. We have just chosen to ignore it. And you're surprised sometimes. I remember one case where I'm reading some early 20th century um, newspapers, and there's this huge spread about what's going on in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I don't think if you ask any, Amer any historians of China what was the impact of America's colonization of the Philippines on China, they'd say, well, they probably didn't notice it, because we have totally decided to ignore that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happened in the case of the March 1st movement. Mm -hmm. It doesn't enter into the literature at all. 
-hmm. That seems to be mm -hmm. improbable that that's true. Mm -hmm. And I bet if we started looking for it in the newspapers at the time, there's a lot of attention to it. So this is like, for some graduate student, it's like a great, yeah. a great mm -hmm. field. Right. Can, I, can I just add one other thing to what Ed was uh, saying, if I may? I actually have also written about uh, Sino-American rivalry in the third world, and I was looking at sort of the origins of Chinese third worldism. And, you know, obviously that goes back to 1919 and this idea of a community of the oppressed. Uh, but if you look at what Mao was writing in, like, the Shang River Review and other publications, like, a lot of it was uh, very cognizant of Korea and also the fact that Korea was betrayed uh, at the Versailles Conference in much the same way that uh, China was. So. And, and one of the leaders of the uh, May 4th movement, a, 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 uni a, universe, a Beijing University professor, actually praised the Korean people for their patriotism uh, during the uh, March 1st movement and contrasted that with, uh, you know, sort of self-centered uh, Chinese before the, uh, the May 4th movement as well. So, uh, I'd like to turn to uh, Professor Park. He had something to say about the uh, division of uh, or internal tensions within Korea. Uh, and how it might be related to the uh, division of Korea in 1945. Contrast that with uh, Austria and other countries you didn't get to in your presentation. Yes. Uh, due to the time limit, I did show up the uh, K, uh, PPT chart uh, during my presentation. First of all, yes, I have harshly criticized Japanese imperialism, Japanese militarism, Japanese totalitarianism. As you uh, separately back to the American uh, Polish toward, okay, other countries, I must separately back ourselves, okay, to uh, mm -hmm. reorganize the past history. Okay, first of all, yes, needless to say, President Wilson, he's a sheer racialist. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. according to recent, okay, uh, uh, research, he has a secretary affiliate with the KKK. Wilson, and he did not. He didn't not talk about the okay territorial or sovereign population. Even he talked about this uh, separate determination later. He only talked about okay the uh, racial population around around the neighboring countries of Russia, not around Japan, not around America, only around the. Russia, then just pinpoint, just one con country. Turkey, he said, we remember his one point rule. Okay? Some person with one blood of other color, then his neighbor white people. He continued the one point rule so strictly. Okay, and I'd like to emphasize again he has secretary affiliated with the KKK. According to recent publication, then how can you differentiate the differences between the concept of national liberation of Renin, and Renin's conceptualization of national liberation, and Wilsonian conceptualization of self determination? Being from the yes, underdeveloped or colonized people, I failed to find some differences. Renin, he killed the neighboring, under those species of national liberation, they shouted the national independence and autonomy from Russian Empire. Then he killed all the people, from Basmashi to uh, uh, Georgia. Then uh, I think why we need to establish the third point to a new point, new paradigm, global, civil, possibly to combine these two things, global level and local level for the another level of universality or okay, uh, universalism. Okay. That, that's the starting point going, the, the, I'm sorry, to go beyond the simultaneous the victim mentality and uh, okay, conquer uh, or perpetrate uh, mentality, I think. And about the uh, okay, gentleman raised the question, Yes, uh, Korean people have divided into two blocks, two groups, two camps, nationalist and communist, conservative and okay, uh, radicals. 
after the much first uh, movement, some of the uh, scholars argue uh, this kind of separate lay the foundation of the, the future Korean war as a civil war. I, I couldn't accept at all because let's compare the Austrian case, Finnish case, Turkish case, Irish case. After the Bolshevik revolution, they fought each other, civil war. Separated, so harshly separated. Okay. Even Otto Bauer and Karl Leno, Lenin said, we kill them, they are reactionaries because they raised the flag of national independence, national autonomy, Otto Bauer and Karl Leno. But the problem is, after the end of the World War I, uh, World War II, we got the second chance of possibility, opening of here to uh, history. In case of Austria, in case of Finland, Ireland, okay, the Michael Coinsley the Foundation, Gabriel Princip in Serbia, in Italy, even in the Italy, they knew this kind of global division put the stand for themselves. And then they tried to establish the unified government, united government. In Finland, Mannerheim, leftist, rightist, they tried to establish it as a Reagan. Mannerheim in Austria, Carleno succeeded in unifying all the groups. In Italy, even the Communist Party, they entered into the reactionary government after Mussolini. Communist leaders or to participate in the reactionary government, okay, against the national division. But in South Korea, immediately after the World War II, yes, it's there. The Norsk, in order to prepare for the general order number one, they gathered the maps and delineated the 38 parallel, and they fought the time and around that time, like Finnish leaders, Irish leaders, Italian leaders, and Austrian leaders, they knew from the Hideous invasion, the neighboring empires tried to separate the Korean peninsula, repeated again and again. Russo Japanese were the same, but Sengmanni, he never met, never visited Pyongyang, twice the one unified country. Kim Il sung never visited Seoul. Just the tragedy, the internal condition of separation. These two conditions, external condition, national, uh, general order number one, Dean Rusk and the later General MacArthur issue, this kind of internal separation. And later on, the most serious conflict in the world, trusty Piasco, trusty Imbrillio, then I think, going from the global civil perspective, how to reflect ourselves and how to criticize the uh, world environment without combining these two things, I don't think we can achieve some level of global peace or global uh, civil peace. How, how are we doing on time? We... Yeah. Okay. I, I saw a couple other questions, but I uh, apologize, uh, and you need to talk to the speakers uh, directly. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. We had uh, two good hours of uh, very nice uh, presentations and discussions, uh, and I'd like to ask you to give a big hand to the presenters. It's a really a great pleasure to introduce um, the Honorable uh, Jungle Lee. Um, in many ways, this event is um, inspired by a discussion that he and I had last year when he visited SAIS um, and, and, and talked about the, um, the need to, to uh, hold an event uh, to elevate awareness of, of the March Earth Movement in Washington, D.C. Um, so I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled that, that he uh, has agreed to, to join us and, and uh, to deliver some remarks. Um, the Honorable uh, Assemblyman, Mr. Uh, Lee, is, is a five-term South Korean politician. 
Uh, he's currently serving um, as a member of the 20th National Assembly, as a, a member of the, um, uh, the Minju Party. Um, he comes from a distinguished family um, uh, of, of politicians and activists in South Korea. His grandfather, uh, Lee Ho Young, was a Korean independence activist who spent his life fighting Japanese colonialists. His grand uncle, um, Lee Si Young, uh, was also an independence activist, as well as the first vice president of South Korea from 1948 to 1951. Uh, both of his uh, grandfather and gra or both his grandfather and granduncle were signatories uh, of the 1919 Korean Declaration of Independence, which marked the beginning of the March First Movement. Um, the Honorable uh, Lee Jong-gol is, is currently the chairman of the Special Committee on commemorating uh, the 100th anniversary of the March First Movement and the Provisional Government of the Republic of Korea. Uh, which, which is under the auspices of the, the Minju Party of Korea. Um, so it, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, the Honorable uh, uh, Lee Jong-go to the stage to deliver some remarks. So. Thank you for introducing. Okay. Um, Dean uh, Jong-il Yu of the KDI School of Public Policy and Management, and Vice Dean uh, Kent, 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 Kent Calder of the uh, Jones Hawkins School of Advanced International Studies, and distinguished guest who made great effort to prepare today's international conference celebrating the centenary of March First Movement. I'm very pleased that such a meaningful event is being held at the right time when he should gather wisdom is Korea, in Korea and the U.S. to establish peace and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula also, it is great joy and opportunity to give a keynote speech today. A century ago, the people of Joseon desperately opposed the Japanese colonial rule through the Declaration of Independence and clarified their plan for building an independent country to realize popular sovereignty and democracy. They intimate, intimidate the Japanese imperialists by showing that the Joseon people were enlightened. They reminded conscientious people around the world about the presence of Joseon and awaken the Joseon people on the colonial rule to a vision to modern citizen holding sovereign, sovereignty. Students, women, and common people became empowered for the first time in the Korean history. They had committed to the idea of independence and democratic republic. That is, 100 years ago, our nation emerged on the stage of modern world history in a new kind of national movement called the Movement Resistance. The history of each country reveals a universal development process of world history. Friedrich Hegel, German philosophy, formulate in a lecture on the philosophy of history, that history is the process of realizing reason, and the reason is revealed as, as spirit in history. He claimed that the core of the human spirit revealed in history is freedom. Therefore, 
the de development process of history is also the process of expansion of freedom. A distinguished scholar and expert, please allow me to talk for a moment about my family history for the past, past century. The historical experience of my family demonstrate that the development of modern history is, to, is not different from the process of expanding freedom. My family was a noble family, the ruling class of Joseon dynasty. About uh, 12 premier, <coughs> one, uh, 10 generation. But they gave up all their best right and went to China to take part in the independence movement. As Joseon had been degraded to a century of colonial Japan. There were the two contrasting elders of all the six brothers in my family. One was Udang Yuheyong, my grandfather. He had challenged Joseon's feudal society and paved the way toward the modern society. Back then, he was one of the in-law of King Gojong, the last king of Joseon dynasty, and dreamed of abolishing feudal state system and establishing a constitutional monarchy to consume Japanese imperialism. He later broadened his thought for building a new society by interacting with the Lushin of China and Erosenko of Russia uh, before and after the modern, uh, the March First Movement began eventually he pursued anarchism and ideology beyond the country and nation. He was brutally killed when he went to Manchuria in order to take on the uh, command of the Imperial Japanese Army. His life con contributed to the expanding freedom in the realis realization on, of the universal purpose of history. Another elder is Song Jae Yi Shi Young. Uh, his younger, younger brother and my grand uncle. He was a vice minister level government official of Joseon's last monarchy when the so-called Ulsa Protection Treaty was signed. Song Jae fled to Manchuria and served as a cabinet member of the provisional government of the Republic of Korea. After liberation, he became a vice president of the Republic of Korea. He was the only person to serve as a cabinet member for serious three governments, the Korean Empire, the provisional government, and the Republic of Korea. Both elders struck the blow against the maelstrom of history amid the drastic change of the nation's status from a feudal dynasty to the Korean Empire and from a colony to our independence democratic republic. That was also the process of expanding freedom in the life of these individual and the country. In this process, most of the family back then uh, sacrificed their lives for the country in the war against Japanese colonialism. From the perspective of Hegel, I understand 
his 100-year history of the Korean independence movement at the process of expanding the freedom of individual, society, and country. Also, I am looking at the universality of March 1st movement and its place in world history. Celebrating the centenary of March 1st movement is a joyous national occasion. In addition, this year we are also facing an historical tradition through which the frame of the Korean Peninsula will be formed for the next 100 years. As you are well aware, Korea is the one and only Cold War frontier among divided country in the world which had been created artificially by the international interest after Second World War. Even after Korean War, we have been, we have been to the brink of the full-scale military conflict over the North Korean nuclear issues. However, the two Korea are now seeking peace and prosperity and together. The power of the of the Cold War, born in the recognition of Korean order after the Second World War, is how being distributed, this integrated with the centenary of the independence movement. The most serious troubled area in the world is now ready to become a community of peace and prosperity. We could clearly witness the reality of harsh international politics in the North Korea Hanoi summit last month, which had been greatly anticipated throughout the world, ended without any fruitful result. However, I remain optimistic that the Korean Peninsula will be uh, denuclearized and Korea, North Korea will eventually move toward the reform and coming up, opening up. Honorable scholar and expert for South Korea and the U.S., I once again, I would uh, to extend my deepest gratitude to all of you who are here today for sharing and supporting the meaning of the centenary of the March 1st movement at the critical time when South and North Korea are seeking the transition toward the peace and cooperation. The centenary of the Declaration of Independence is not just simply to remember, record, and celebrate the history of the past. In the past, 100 years, the Korean people had established democracy, even though the pain of Japanese colonial rule, the Korean War and national division. South Korea has, been, has become an advanced country of industrialization, democratization, and inform informalization. To celebrate the centenary year is to ratify the values, the March 1st movement, and the provisional government of the Republic of Korea pursued 100 years ago and to establish a starting po point to define new direction and detail for the next 100 years. To celebrate the centenary year is to realize the frame of the national 
integration, which is our desperate task for the present and future of Korea. The future of Republic Korea for the next 100 years requires the vision of a unified Korean Peninsula, establishing the vision, ideal, and strategy for unification of Korean Peninsula, create a bridge connection the past 100 years and the next 100 years. The ultimate purpose of today's event is to edify the spirit and value of March 1st movement <coughs> for the start of a new 100 history of the Korean people. The unification of the Korean Peninsula is not a problem only for the two countries, Koreas. This is also a global issue that should be handled with the cooperation and support for committee around the whole world, including the US, China, Japan, and Russia. I would like to respectfully ask US expert who are here today to gather your wisdom and share your experience in order to seek the normalization of North Korea. The denuclearization of Korean Peninsula and establishment of peaceful and prosperous community on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all for, um, for joining us for uh, the second panel um, in which we are going to look at uh, more domestic uh, uh, developments, both um, in 1919 and, and also longer term, the long, longer term impact um, of the March 1st movement uh, on uh, uh, political, um, uh, socio-political um, developments on the Korean Peninsula. Um, we uh, are going to be a little pressed for time because we have uh, two um, presentations that are going to be uh, consecutively interpreted. Uh, so I'm going to uh, keep my um, introductory remarks very brief and, and just um, uh, um, say that you, you have their bios, um, uh, but we have three distinguished um, uh, panelists. Um, we have um, first uh, actually, I think it's first, Dr. Uh, uh, Kyungno Yoon of, of Hansung University. Um, we will then have uh, Dr. jong Eun Kim of uh, Chincheon National University of Education, followed by um, Michael Shin of Cambridge University. Um, uh, we, uh, um, again, we'll have translation, um, but we hope to have enough time for um, at least 15, 20 minutes for, um, for Q&A at the end. Uh, and at the end, I hope that you all join us in going to the um, old legation building. Just about a 10 minute walk from here. Uh, hopefully the snow or rain uh, will, will uh, hold off um, uh, for a reception. Um, Dr. Yoon to, to uh, start his presentation. Yoon Kyung Ro. Yeah, Yoon Kyung Ro. Young no, uh, to deliver his presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, with the Hansung University working as a professor. I'm with the Hansung University working as a professor. Honestly speaking, actually, I'm not teaching anymore. I'm uh, not teaching anymore. I'm not teaching uh, I am called what, uh, what they endearingly call as a white hand. Yeah. I've been a white hand for seven years. Yeah, uh, the theme today is the 
I would like to speak on the revolutionary aspects of the 3 1 movement uh, and also the symbolic uh, meaning and the uh, realities uh, that is faced uh, by the movement these days. Uh, 앞서 첫 섹션에서 박명린 교수께서 uh, 3.1 운동이 갖는 이 글로벌, 글로벌, 세계사적인 그런 음, 그 의미를 uh, 설명했습니다. Earlier during the first uh, session, uh, Professor Park Myung Lim spoke on the global uh, meaning of the 3.1 movement. 저는 uh, 한국사를 그 전공한 사람으로 국내에서 3.1 운동이 갖는 그런 역사성에 대해서 주로 말씀을 드리겠습니다. I am a historian and as such I would focus on the meaning of the 3.1 uh, movement in Korea. 3일 운동 어, 아시는 대로 일본이 한국을 병탐한 지 해수로 10년 만에 일어난 어, 운동입니다. The uh, 31 movement occurred on the 10th uh, year of uh, occupation that started by the Japanese on the Korean Peninsula. 음, 한국이 근대 사회의 에, 진입은 에, 일반적으로 1876년 강화도 조약으로 출발한다고 보고 있습니다. Uh, the uh, first entry into the international order by the Korea uh, would go back to 1876, uh, otherwise known as the Treaty of Kangwa Island. But this Kangwa Island is the first Korean island, but it was a very strong it was uh, one of the first uh, modern day uh, treaty entered by Korea and at the same time it was a very lopsided uh, treaty. 근대 사회를 진입하면서 맺는 국가 국가 간의 조약에는 uh, 가장 중요한 것이 당시에는 통상을 위한 그런 관세 조항이었습니다. The uh, foremost important clause in these uh, treaties uh, back then is the commerce uh, treaty which relate to the customs uh, by yeah, paid by the nations trading together. 근데 이 강화도 조약 때이 관세 조항 자체가 들어가질 않았습니다. Uh, the problem with the uh, Treaty of Kangwa Island is that there was no mention of the customs. 오늘날은 세상이 좋아져서 국가 국간의 FTA에서 무관세 세상이 됐지만 uh, 19세기의 국가 국가 간의 자국의 자, uh, 산업이나 uh, 도착 자본을 보호하기 위해서는 관세 조항을 통해서 국가의 어, 경제나 어, 산업을 보호했습니다. In the old days the way a nation would protect themselves uh, with other uh, na against other nations uh, would be to levy uh, duties and customs on the trade that comes through their borders. Of course these days uh, we prize a free trade uh, but back then uh, that's not what we were aiming for. 그런데 이 일본과 맺은 최초의 근대 조약에서는 관세 조항이 없다가 82년에 미국과 맺는 조미 수호 통상 조약에서 비로소 관세가 들어가기, 들어가게 됩니다. And so uh, this uh, Kangwa Treaty which was entered into with the uh, Japanese uh, did not have any duties uh, levied. Uh, but uh, in a few years, uh, there would be a new treaty entered uh, with the U.S. and this would be in 1882. And then, only then, uh, do we have uh, customs uh, being levied. 그래서 관세 조항이 뒤늦게 중요하다는 걸 uh, So the Koreans became, uh, came to realize that tariff uh, was uh, such an important factor after 1882, and uh, Korea did uh, try to adjust or otherwise amend uh, the Treaty of Kangwa with uh, Japan. 그래서 한국 한국은 어그 개항 이후에 여러 가지 그 일본의 그런 그 차별적인 어 그런 통치와 지배 위에서 그 십여 년 동안 이게 축적돼 있었습니다 불만들이. So the lopsided uh, treaty of Kangwa, uh, dating back uh, 30 years uh, before the 20, uh, 20th century, uh, was uh, what pretty much determined the course uh, for the Korea on the Korean Peninsula. After the opening of the port, uh, it has always been lopsided. 그래서 이 삼일운동이 일어난 것도 나라가 이미 망하고 
이제 주권과 국권이 일본에 넘어간 이후 10년간의 일본의 그런 무단 통치에 반발해서 아, 일반 백성들이 국가가 없는 상태에서 어, 스스로 봉기한 그런 어, 사건입니다. So as of 1919, uh, on the uh, eve of uh, 31 uh, movement, uh, Korea has been subjugated by the foreign powers for a long time already. And at that point, uh, we have already lost our sovereignty and unable to rule ourselves. So the movement is by the people who did not have a country. 예, 제가 오늘 어, 3일 운동을 혁명이라고 어, 좀 어, 그 업그레이드 한다고 할까 이렇게 하는 몇 가지 이유를 설명해 보겠습니다. And I uh, go get into the reason why I call the movement a revolution uh, because this is a, a much a stronger term than the movement. 우린 지난 100여 년 동안 어, 오늘 발표에서도 어, 무브먼트란 말을 계속 쓰고 지금도 뭐 그렇게 쓰고 있지만은 삼일 운동이 갖는 그 혁명적인 의미는 어, 이거는 역사의 해석상의 가능성이 있다 가능하다고 이렇게 봅니다. The interpretation of what happened on the uh, three, uh, three one as uh, whether a movement or, or a revolution uh, really depends on who is looking at the history. 흔히 역사학은 해석학이라고 얘기합니다. Often it's said that who looks at the history determines the history. 어, 과거의 역사적 사실, 팩트는 변할 수 없지만 어, 그것을 어, historical fact, 말하자면 어, 역사적 팩트는 변함이 없지만 그거에 대한 역사적 해석은 시대와 시대의 상황과 조건에 따라서 다르게 해석될 수 있다고 생각합니다. Uh, we can't deny that certain events took place, uh, but as to the significance and the interpretation of the event uh, depends on the timing and who is doing the interpretation. 우리 한국 사회에서는 과거에 uh, 동학 어, 지금은 동학혁명이라고 하지만 옛날에는 다 동학난이라고 했습니다. Uh, we have something called the uh, uh, revolution of uh, 동학. Uh, this is actually often. Uh, called a term the uh, insurgency of Dongak in the old days. Uh, 그러나 당시에는 치자 지배자 입장에서 볼 때는 동학은 uh, 난에 불과했지만은 오늘날의 입장에서는 동학을 난이라고 하지 않고 uh, 민중들이 uh, 당시의 시대적으로 꼭 풀어야 할 역사적 과제인 반봉건의 문제와 반외세의 문제를 정확하게 적시하고 이를 <웃음> 어, 운동으로 어, 어, 말하자면 어, 일으켰다고 하는 점에서 이거를 혁명성을 부여했던 것입니다. The Dongak event is when looked at by the governing people back then a an insurgent insurgency against the, the existing regime. Uh, however, uh, these days, when we look back on what happened uh, with Dongak, we look on it as a revolution because it was an attempt uh, to change the society as it existed uh, back then. 3일 운동도 1919년 당시에는 서요라 폭동이라고 기록되어 있습니다. And uh, even uh, the uh, uh, three-one movement uh, back then, uh, the way it is termed uh, by the ones uh, who were ruling, uh, would call it a uh, an uprise. 그러나 시간이 흐르면서 삼일 혁명이란 말을 어, 쭉 써왔고, 어, 그리고 사실 우리 재헌 헌법 초안에도 삼일 혁명이란 말이 써 있었습니다. Uh, nevertheless. Uh, <웃음> After uh, the occupation has ended by the Japanese on the Korean Peninsula, uh, we no longer call it the uprise. Uh, we call it the revolution. Uh, that's uh, how it was in the beginning. Uh, we even are able to find it in our uh, initial uh, con constitution of Korea. The Three-One Movement is the most important reason for 삼일 어, 운동의 결과로 우리 역사에 두 가지 큰 변화가 있었습니다. 보는 이유 보지 않는 두 응? 보는 이유 보지 않는 이유. 
Okay. The reason why we uh, look at it as a revolution, uh, there are, are two very big uh, reasons in our history. 국내적으로는 일본의 과거의 무단 통치가 문화 정치로 변했습니다. And uh, in uh, within Korea, the ruling by the Japanese after the 31 uh, revolution had uh, become more civilized, uh, whereas uh, before it was much more savage. 그러나 일본의 소위 문화 정치는 우리 민족을 어 분열시키는 그런 더 교활한 정치였고 통치 방법이었고 또그 친일파를 양성하는 그런 정책이었습니다. So called the cultural uh, ruling uh, in uh, South Korea in Korea by the Japanese uh, was actually an attempt uh, to bifurcate uh, to divide the Korean people amongst ourselves. 나 그보다 중요한 것은 혁명으로 보는 이유는 해외에서 일어났습니다. However, uh, the real reason why this should be called a revolution is what took place outside of Korea. Yeah. 운동이 일어난 지 40일 만인 uh, 상하이에서 대한민국 임시 정부가 수립되었습니다. Uh, after 40 days of the 31 movement, uh, we have the establishment of the provisional government of Korea in Shanghai. 대한민국 임시 정부가 수립되기 그 이전의 한국 정부는 대한 제국이었습니다. Before the uh, Korean uh, government uh, was uh, established, uh, Korea was actually known as the Korean Empire. Yeah. 그러니까 제국에서 민국이 된 겁니다. Uh, from an empire, now we have become a republic. 그 역사에서 우리의 긴 봉건적인 왕조 시대에서 그걸 마감하고 1919년 3일 운동의 결과로 민국 대한 민국이 생겨났다는 겁니다. Uh, we have had a long history of feudalism in Korea, and that ended in 1919 when the provisional government was given a birth as a republic. 다시 거듭 얘기하지만은 말하자면. 왕조 국가에서 주권 재민의 민국이 되었다고 하는 것은 이거는 우리 역사로 볼때 혁명과 같은 일이라고 봐야 될 겁니다. And uh, so the feudalism uh, really is a ruling uh, by the king or the emperor and that had lasted for a long time and with the uh, establishment of a republic uh, now we have a sovereignty that is in the hands of the people and not in the king. 그 좋은 사례가 중국의 경우에 신의 혁명과 같은 의미를 부여할 수 있지 않는가라고 생각합니다. In the uh, same uh, reasoning, uh, I believe uh, the three one movement can be called a revolution uh, so, uh, that is in line with the Xinhai revolution of the China. 중국의 순원이라고 하는 분이. 에, 1911년에 중화민국을 만들었습니다. Uh, Sun Wan of uh, China established the, the Republic of China in 1911. 그러니까 중국의 그 전통적인 고래로부터 내려오는 그 왕조를 왕조 시대를 다 마감하고 1911년에 말하자면 중화민국이 태어났다 이 말입니다. So the old dynastic rule of China has ended in 1911 when the republic uh, Chinese republic was born by Sun Wan. 말하자면, 말하자면 so the 1911 uh, was the uh, Xinhai revolution. Uh, because the old dynasty, old uh, rule by feudalism, has ended. 그렇다면 한국도 그와 같이 이 삼일 운동을 삼일 혁명으로 볼수 있지 않느냐 이런 문제 제기입니다. In the same light, the three one movement can also be seen as a revolution. 다음으로는 삼일 혁명이 갖는 그 정신에 대해서 몇 가지 간단간단하게 소개해 드리겠습니다. Uh, let me address uh, some of the idealism that was espoused by uh, three one movement. 
3일 운동이 일어난 그, 그 정신은 3일 독립 선언서에 잘 나타나 있습니다. The spirit of three one movement is well uh, indicated in the independence uh, letter uh, that was written. 첫째가 자주 독립 정신입니다. The independence uh, by uh, self uh, self independence. I'm sorry. In the uh, independence declaration. 두 번째가 자유 민주 정신입니다. And uh, freedom loving and a democratic society. 당시에는 우선 그 식민지에 있었기 때문에 자주 독립을 세우는 것을 제 일로 어, 해서 독립 만세 운동을 일으켰지만은 그런 독립된 나라만을 세우는 게 중요한 게 아니라 그 독립된 나라를 세운 속에 살고 있는 국민들의 자유 민주 정신을 강조하고 있습니다. So within the declaration of course uh, we wanted independence uh, but what type of independence do we want? It's an independence that expanded the freedom and the democratic uh, power of the people of Korea. 그러니까 독립된 나라를 세우더라도 그걸 구성하는 그 국민들의 자유와 어, 그 민주 정신 이것이 곁들지 않으면 안 된다는 것을 분명히 선언서에 담고 있습니다. In the declaration, it was made clear that not only do we want an independent nation, but the independent nation would be constituted by people who are freedom loving and who are democratic. 셋째는 인류 공용의 평화 정신이 그 독립 선언서 안에 깃들어져 있습니다. And within the declaration, also uh, we have a a global uh, peace uh, that we aspire as a human, uh, humankind. 제가 이걸 준비하면서 그 미국의 토마스 제퍼슨이 1776년에 한 독립 선언문의 내용을 잠시 검토해 봤습니다. As I prepared uh, today's uh, remarks, I had a chance to read the uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, remarks uh, prior to the 1776 declaration being made in the US 영국의 절대 왕정에 반대하여 자유 평등 인민 주권의 확립을 주장한 이 선언문은 모든 사람은 평등하게 태어났고 하나님은 양도할 수 없는 권리 곧 생명과 뭐 이런 내용을 쭉 얘기하고 있는데 이 내용과 벌적에 우리 3일 운동의 김이 독립선언의 내용이 훨씬 스케일이 크다 이런 걸 느꼈습니다. And uh, Mr. Jefferson uh, speaks on the idea of all people being created equal and that there are certain indivisible uh, rights uh, that we are innately born with. And I believe a 31 uh, declaration uh, contains uh, these ideas and more. 다시 말해서 우리 3일 독립 선언문에 당, 담긴 정신은 우리 개인의 자, 어, 개인과 자국의 독립만을 주장하는 데 그친 게 아니라 한중일 동양 삼국의 평화는 물론 더 나아가 인류 공영을 주장하고 있다는 점에서 이게 어, 상당한 어, 그 가치가 있는 어, 그런 선언사라고 얘기할 수 있겠습니다. Uh, the spirit captured in the three one declaration. Uh, is uh, not limited uh, to individuals or to the Korean Peninsula and not only limited to the peace amongst Korea, Japan and China but actually it reaches even uh, fo uh, further forward and it looks at the humanity as a whole and that there should be a global uh, prosperity uh, that is to be shared by all people. 3일 운동이 갖는 혁명성은 여러 가지 있습니다. 시간이 다 돼가는 것 같아서 I'm afraid I'm running out of my time. Uh, although I do want to speak uh, quite a bit about the revolutionary meaning of the three one uh, movement. Uh, so maybe per per perhaps I'll just focus on the uh, contemporary meaning uh, that the movement has now. 삼일 정신과 삼일 uh, 운동이 갖는 현재성은 지난 2017년 18년에 겨울에 있었던 불들이 외친 대한민국은 민주공화국이다라는 뜻에 잘 연결되어 있다고 생각합니다. Uh, the, uh, there was a motto uh, that was used by the uh, candlelight uh, visuals uh, that were uh, 
say, movement in, back in 2017 and 18 in Korea. And the, the model was that the Korea is a republic, a, a democratic republic. And that is very well actually uh, capturing the idea of a 3-1 movement. 이때 권력은 국민으로부터 나온다는 함성을 지쳐치른 그 정신이 바로 3일 운동과 연계된다고 어, 하는 점에서 우리에게 큰 울림이 있다고 생각합니다. And what the uh, candlelight visual uh, demonstrators were saying uh, was that the power, all power comes from people, and that is indeed uh, the very spirit uh, captured in the 3-1 movement. 3일 혁명과 아, 촛불 혁명 사이에는 백여 년이라는 어, 그 시차가 있지만 예, 아놀 토임비 역사학자가 얘기했듯이 이거야말로 역사의 어떤 동시성 같은 의미를 갖지 않는가 생각해 봅니다. So the uh, candlelight uh, revolution of 2017-18 is about 100 years away from the 3-1 uh, revolution. However, the uh, spirit uh, captured in the two revolutions are the same, and this is uh, precisely what Arnold uh, Toynbee was uh, referring to when he said contemporary ideas. 지난해 9월 19일 문재인 대통령은 평양 능라도 어, 체육관에서 어, 평양 시민들을 앞에서 어, 이렇게 어, 연설한 바 있습니다. In uh, 2018, uh, President Moon went to Pyongyang. And at the uh, Nungla Do uh, convention, uh, he spoke as following. 남북이 지난 70년간을 떨어져 살았지만 우리 민족은 5천 년을 함께한 하나의 민족임을 어, 연설함으로써 큰 울림을 우리에게 주었습니다. He said uh, that South and North Koreans have been separated for 70 years, but uh, we have been together for 5,000 years. And this uh, gained a very good reaction from the North Koreans. 통죽불통이요. 불통죽통이란 고사가 있습니다. Uh, you can go through, but you can't actually go through. And you do not go through, but you do, you do go through. Uh, this is the Chinese wording. 남북 간에 통하면, 이거 얘기하면 기, 기, 설명이 오래 갈 거, 그냥 아, 넘어가겠습니다. 아, 일단 바라기는 3.1운동 100주년을 아, 맞으면서 어, 남북의 문제가 좀 풀렸으면 하는 마음이 있는데 에, 여기에는 그 어, 우리 옛 고의, 고사에 만절필동이라는 말이 있는데 이게 뭐냐면 만 번을 이렇게 구비쳐 흐르지만 은 올라갔다 내려갔다 하지만 결국은 물은 흘러 흘러서 어, 동해 바다로 내려간다 그런 뜻입니다 말하자면 남북 관계가 70여 년 동안 이렇게 우여곡절이 많았지만 결국은 역사에 그 도도히 흐르는 큰 물줄기는 막을 수 없는 것 아닌가. 이래서 저는 역사학자로서 남북 문제가 앞으로 잘 풀려갈 것으로 어, 기대하고 소망하는 바입니다. Uh, we have been divided for 70 years. Uh, uh, however, uh, there is a, a saying, uh, 만절 필동, uh, that uh, a water uh, may wave or have uh, 10,000 turns, but eventually end up in the uh, uh, east uh, river, uh, east uh, sea. Uh, basically, what, mean, what it means is that in the uh, river of history, uh, things may take uh, different turns, but eventually it will end up where it's supposed to be ending up. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yoon. Um, now uh, I'd like to uh, turn the mic over to uh, uh, Professor Kim. Um, oh, we have a PowerPoint. Um, shall we go down? Yeah, 예, 안녕하십니까. 만남에서 반갑습니다. 저는 춘천교대에서 학생들한테 한국사를 가르치고 있는 김정인이라고 합니다. I am uh, from the Chungcheong uh, Educational uh, University and I am a professor there. 제 얼굴이 안 보세요. 
예, 제가 오늘 말씀드리는 것은 앞에 나왔던 얘기보다는 좀더 실증적인 이야기가 아닐까 생각됩니다. What I'm about to say is actually more um, informative as far as the facts are concerned. 예, 1919년 3월 1일 날 도대체 무슨 일이 일어났는지 알기가 어려, 어, 실제로 알고 있는 사람들이 많지 않습니다. Yeah, not too many people actually know what really did take place uh, on the, the 3 1 of 1919. 예, 한국에서는 서울 탁골공원에서 3.1 운동이 일어났다 이렇게 많은 사람이 알고 있습니다. In Korea, it's uh, known uh, that in the uh, Tapgol uh, Park. That the 3-1 movement started. 그러나 실제 첫날 일곱 군데에서 시위가 일어났습니다. Uh, actually, what happened was that in seven different locations uh, the movement started. 그날의 시위의 특징을 말한다 하면 예, 연대에 의해서 일어났다 이렇게 설명드릴 수 있겠습니다. Uh, the uh, most uh, salient uh, feature of the movement is that uh, there was a prior uh, understanding of what will take place. 종교 연대, 학생 연대, 그리고 종교와 학생 연대에 의해서 일어났습니다. Uh, there was the affiliation uh, between the students and the uh, religious leaders, and then amongst the different religions, uh, there was also an affiliation. 예, 먼저 그날 시위를 첫날 일어난 시위를 만세 시위라고 부릅니다. Uh, it is often called as the 만세 demonstration, uh, referring to the fact that they were calling for longevity of Korea. 만세라는 건 만년이란 뜻이고 실제로는 영원하라 이런 의미를 갖고 있습니다. Uh, 만세 in Korean is a for 10,000 years, uh, basically meaning for uh, going into the permanency. 당시에 만세의 뜻이 뭐냐고 물어봤을 때 어, 현순이라는 당시 독립운동가의 아들인 피터 현이 어렸을 때 3일 운동을 겪었던 기억을 하면서 그건 자유였다 이렇게 집약해서 말한 적이 있습니다. And uh, there was a uh, well-known uh, person by the name 현순. And he had uh, stated that manse means uh, freedom uh, for the Korean people because uh, that's what the manse movement was for the Koreans in uh, 3.1. 예, 피터 현은 만세라는 이름으로 미국에서 책을 냈었습니다. 3.1운동의 경험을 기억하면서. In fact, uh, 현 순, uh, whose uh, English name is uh, Peter Hyun, uh, published a book in the U.S. Uh, in, in, with the title Manse. 예. 1919년에 3월 1일 날 만세 시위가 일어난 곳은 모두 일곱 군데입니다. And the uh, Manse uh, movement uh, started in seven different locations on uh, 3 1 uh, 1919. 예, 서울, 평양, 진남포, 안주, 선천, 의주, 어, 원산입니다. Uh, these are the seven cities on the PowerPoint. Uh, Seoul, Pyongyang, uh, Jinnampo, Anju, Seoncheon, Seoncheon, uh, Uiju, and Wonsan. 예, 평양, 진남포, 안주는 평안남도입니다. And uh, 평양 and 진남포 are within uh, 평안남도. 예, 어, 선천과 의주는 평안북도입니다. Uh, 선천 and 의주 are in 평안북도, which is the northern province of 평양. 예. 안. 원산은 평, 함경남도입니다. Wonsan is uh, 함경남도, which is the southern province of 함경. 서울을 뺀 여섯 개 도시의 지명 자체가 어, 좀 낯설 것입니다. Uh, these are cities are perhaps you're not as familiar other than uh, Seoul. 예, 그 이유는 어. 아, 어, 모두 어, 지, 어, 지금 현재 이제 북한 지역 지도인데요. 서울을 뺀 여섯 개 도시가 모두 북한 지역에 있습니다. Uh, you're looking at actually the Northern Korean, uh, North Korea's uh, map, and other than Seoul, uh, all these other six uh, cities are in North uh, Korea. 예, 지금 현재 평안 함경남도였던 원산은 지금 북한에서는 강원도에 속해 있습니다. Uh, 오른, Wonsan, 오른쪽입니다. Uh, which uh, was previously uh, Hamgyong uh, Southern Province is now part of Gangwon-do in North Korea. 여기 평양이, 아, 평양이랑 그다음에 진남포랑 안주. 다음에 선천, 의주가 다 이쪽에 있습니다. So uh, you're looking at the uh, 선천, 의주, 진남포, 평양, and 원산, uh, which are all on this uh, the western part of uh, North Korea. 그 북한 지역에 있기 때문에 이 남북 분단으로 인해서 북한 지역에서 3월 1일에 일어난 만세 시위는 널리 알려지지 않았습니다. So the Manse movement that occurred in the North Korean uh, proper is not as well known amongst the Korean populations now. 어, 그 먼저 예, 일어난 순서를 한번 예, 보도록 하면요. 
어, 서울에서 오후 2시에 일어난 것으로 많은 사람들이 알고 있지만 사실은 평안문도 이 선천에서 12시에 먼저 일어났습니다. Let's look at the uh, sequence of the uh, events of uh, 3 1. Uh, often times people would say uh, Seoul was the first uh, point, uh, but that's not true actually. Uh, Seoul was at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and then uh, Suncheon uh, was the first uh, city, which was at 12 o'clock. 예, 그러면 음, 3월 1일에 일어, 일어난 시위를 그림을 그리듯이 일단 설명을 드려보겠습니다. Okay, let's uh, see if we can uh, trace it. There. 1919년 3월 1일 12시에 평안북도 선천에 자리한 기독교계 학교인 신성학교에서 교사와 학생들이 독립선언식을 거행하고 거리로 쏟아져 나와 만세를 불렀습니다. Uh, so at the 12 o'clock of uh, 3-1 uh, at the Sunchon, uh, there were students and teachers of uh, Sinsung uh, uh, Christian uh, School and uh, they uh, read a declaration and came onto the streets. 이때 천도교라는 기, 음, 종교인들도 함께 했습니다. Also, there were a Chondo people who, this is another religious belief, and these people were with the Sinsung people. Chondo교라는 것은 동학의, 동학의 어떤 정신에 기독교적인 의식을 결합시킨 신종교였습니다. Chondo was a, actually a new religion that was a combination of the Christian ideals combined with the Donghak spirit. 그리고 평안남도 평양에서는 장로교, 감리교, 천도교가 한 시에 각각 고종 고종의 죽음을 기리는 추모식을 가진 다음에 거리로 나와 연합 시위를 벌였습니다. In uh, Pyongyang, uh, there were three uh, different uh, religious uh, groups: uh, the Presbyterians, uh, Methodists, Methodist, and also Chondo people, uh, who had uh, commemorated the, the death of uh, Gojong and came onto the streets uh, together. 예, 그래서 이 북한에서 나온 책에는 평양 시위가 먼저 나옵니다. 3.1운동에 관련된 책에는. So, uh, the, uh, the Jin Nampo city of Pyongyang Namdo, uh, the students uh, uh, and people of the Sin Hung uh, church uh, came onto the streets together. Jin Nampo was a Sin Hung city, and the workers were also involved. Uh, there were some uh, laborers uh, who were also involved uh, since this was a newly created industrial city. 같은 오후 2시에 함경남도 원산에서도 장날을 맞이 시장이 열리는 날을 맞이해서 기독교인과 학생들이 참가한 가운데 독립 선언식이 일어났습니다. 벌어졌습니다. Yeah. Also at 2 uh, o'clock in the city of Wonsan, uh, we had the Christians and also students who came onto the streets together. 현재 북한 지방에 자리한 선천, 음, 평양, 그 원산 예, 이런 진남포 이런 네개 도시와 함께 두 시에 서울에서 독립 선언식이 있었습니다. Along with the uh, cities in North Korea, the Suncheon, Pyongyang, Wonsan, and Jinnampo, the people of Seoul came onto the streets at two o'clock in the afternoon. 예, 비록 북한 지역에 다수가 일어났지만 3.1 운동을 준비한 것은 서울이었기 때문에 서울의 시위는 좀더큰 규모로 일어났습니다. Uh, although this was uh, in uh, different cities and most of those cities uh, being in North Korea, uh, Seoul was the biggest uh, movement uh, because uh, Seoul uh, is where all these uh, plannings uh, took place. 서울에서는 독립선언서에 서명을 한 민족 대표들과 학생들이 따로 독립선언식을 가졌습니다. Uh, in Seoul, uh, we had a, a separate uh, ceremony where the uh, people who have uh, signed on to the declaration, along with the students, and uh, they had made the statements in the in the open. 학, 어, 먼저 민족 대표라고 하면은 천도교인과 기독교인이 먼저 연합 시위를 이제 준비한 것이라고 볼수 있습니다. And uh, when we speak of the representatives of the people, uh, we speak of the uh, religious leaders of Chondo and uh, Christianity. Chondo교인과 기독교인이 함께 시위를 벌이기로 약속한 날은 2월 24일이었습니다. Actually, the event uh, that was supposed to take place uh, according to the Chondo and the Christian uh, leaders uh, was on uh, February 24th. 
예, 3일 운동 6일 전이었습니다. Uh, this was actually six days uh, prior to the actual 3-1 movement, uh, obviously. 예, 어, 학생들은 그 소식을 듣고 어, 어, 민족 대표들이 하는 독립 선언식에 참가하기로 결정을 했, 했습니다. And once the students have heard of these uh, civic uh, leaders uh, wanting to do the demonstration, uh, students also wanted to join them. 민족 대표들은 3월 1일 날 시위를 준비했지만 본래 학생들이 준비한 시위는 3월 5일 시위였습니다. So uh, the, actually the dates are differ a bit because the civic leaders eventually decided on uh, March 1st, but the students uh, wanted to do it on March 5th. 그래서 3월 1일 시위 소식을 듣고는 5일 소, 5일 날 학생만의 시위도 하지만 예, 그 기독교인들과 천도교인들이 연합해서 하는 시위에도 참가하기로 그렇게 결정을 했습니다. So the way it was decided was that the students wanted to make sure that they also do the 35 movement. And at the same time, join the civic leaders for the 3-1 movement. 예, 그런데 이 민족 대표에는 그 불교까지 합, 어, 합류를 해서 천도교, 기독교, 불교 대표 33명을 구성을 했습니다. The civic leaders actually consisted of 33 people eventually uh, who were from the Chondo religion, uh, Christian religion, as well as the Buddhism. 예, 그래서 이 민족 대표들이 한 일이 한일 중에 가장 중요한 일은 독립 선언서를 인쇄해서 배포하는 일을 했습니다. For the civic leaders the most important event for them was to make sure that they print these declarations and be able to distribute them. 그리고 천도교인과 기독교인들은 자기들이 영향력을 갖고 있는 북부 지방 북부 지방의 천도교인과 기독교인이 많이 살고 있었기 때문에 그 지역에서 3월 1일 날 동시에 시위를 할 것을 결정합니다. And the religious leaders of Chondo and Christianity because the, their influence was bigger in the northern proper of the Korean peninsula they wanted to have a large scale movement in the northern proper on March 1st. 3월 1일 전날인 2월 28일 날 전국의 독립 선언서를 배포하는 일도 민족 대표들이 했습니다. And the civic leaders have in fact distributed these declarations throughout the Korean peninsula on February 28th. 단그 전국의 그 독립 선언서를 배포를 하고 일곱 개 도시에서의 시위가 준비되는 과정에서 그 학생들이 어 민족 대표들의 시위에 가담한다는 소식을 듣고 예, 충돌을 우려해서 일본 경찰과의 충돌을 우려, 우려해서 그 급히 장소를 바꿨습니다. Uh, so uh, the decision uh, before the 3-1 uh, movement was to take place was uh, that the students uh, would also help uh, the civic leaders, but the concern was that there might be a clash uh, with the uh, Japanese uh, police. 예, 그래서 학생들은 3월 1일 날 어, 탑골 공원에서 독립 선언식을 갖고 민족 대표들은 태화관이라는 음식, 음식점에서 독립 선언식을 가졌습니다. Uh, so actually they uh, the students and the civic leaders are split up in two uh, two different locations within Seoul. Uh, the students uh, had their movement uh, started in the Tapgol uh, Park uh, and then the uh, civic leaders had uh, went to the uh, restaurant uh, known as uh, Taeyang uh, restaurant. 어, 삼, 어, 지금 3.1운동 100주년을 맞아서 굉장히 다양하게 3.1운동에 관련된 사건들에 관한 팩트가 체크되고 바로잡혀지고 있고 평가가 달라지고 있는데 이 민족 대표들이 굳이 탑골공원에 가지 않고 음식점에서 이 만세 에, 독립선언식을 가진 다음에 일본 경찰에 체포된 상황에 대해서 이미 본인들이 그 희생을 전달부터 각오하, 각오하고 있었기 때문에 투항이라고 보기는 어렵다 이런 평가를 받고 있습니다. Uh, many new facts are coming to light, and uh, some of the old facts uh, that are otherwise uh, known as, as wrong facts are being uh, corrected uh, these days. And uh, one of those facts uh, that are uh, being shown a uh, new light is uh, what happened at the restaurant. Uh, we have the students at the Top Gold Park, and then we have the civic leaders uh, in the restaurant. The uh, civic leaders in the restaurant actually were uh, arrested uh, by the Japanese uh, police uh, after the declaration was made, uh, but we do not believe this to have been a surrender. 3월 1일 오후 서울에서는 어, 학생들이 거리에서 시민들과 함께 시위를 벌이는 가운데 민족 대표들이 어, 자동차에 실려서 이제 잡혀가는 어떤 모습이 동시에 연출이 되었었습니다. So what happened on 3-1 is that the people who were in the restaurant are now arrested 
and taken uh, to a uh, jail uh, on a uh, truck, apparently. And then you have, on the other hand, uh, students uh, who are moving uh, with the people. <laughs> 오후 2시 서울의 시위와 달리 또두 군데서 시위가 일어났는데 2시 30분에는 의주에서 일어나 만세 시위가 일어났습니다. And the uh, manse movement uh, occurred uh, in uh, 의주 at 2:30. 예, 그리고 오후 5시에는 안주에서 만세 시위가 일어났습니다. And at 5 o'clock we have the movement that uh, started uh, in 안주. 예, 두곳다 기독교인들이 주도를 했습니다. In, in both locations it was led by the uh, Christians. 그리고 이날 어 독립 선언서, 독립 선언식이나 만세 시위는 하지 않았지만 그 독립 선언서가 발견된 지역은 열여덟 곳에 달합니다. And uh, after this uh, date, uh, in 18 different cities, uh, the declaration of the independence, uh, the letter was found. 2월 28일 날 보낸 독립 선언서가 거의 전국에서 발견됐다고 보여집니다. So uh, what has been distributed on February 28 uh, was found uh, throughout uh, the peninsula. 예, 그렇게 3일 운동은 첫 2, 2주 동안 북부 지방에서 주로 일어나게 됩니다. So the uh, three one movement uh, spreads uh, throughout uh, north, uh, throughout uh, the Korean Peninsula uh, for the most part uh, in the northern portion of it. 첫날 서울을 제외한 여섯 개 도시가 북부 지방에 있었다는 것이 바로 이 만세 시위가 이 북부 지방에서 촉발을 하고 2주 동안 확산되는 큰 기여를 하게 된 것입니다. Uh, and the reason why we have most of these activities taking place in the northern part of the Korean Peninsula is because uh, other than Seoul, all six cities were located in the northern part. 2주가 지나고 3월 중순이 되면서 중, 중부 지방과 남부 지방으로 만세 시위가 번져 나갑니다. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the movement uh, would uh, spread uh, to south after two weeks in March. 예, 최고의 절정기는 3월 27일부터 4월 3일까지였습니다. The height of the movement, I would say, was between March 27th to April 3rd. 보통 하루에 50회에서 60회 정도의 시위가 일어났고 제일 많이 일어난 4월 1일은 90회가 일어났습니다. Uh, about 50 to 60 demonstrations broke out uh, each day and on the uh, April 1st which was the highest number of demonstration about 90 demonstration uh, took place. 지금은 분단으로 잊혀졌지만 3월 1일 첫날 여섯 개의 북부 도시에서 일어난 시위가 3일 운동을 확산시키는데 어떤 첫 시발점이 됐다는 점은 매우 중요하다고 생각합니다. Uh, much of the history has been lost uh, because the six cities uh, were in the northern part of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, nevertheless, it is the uh, 31 movement, uh, the, the very day uh, 31 is what started all these in South in Korea. Yeah, 그 그래서 3월 1일 날 일어난 시위의 성격을 어떻게 설명하느냐 했을 때 역시 그 연대의 힘에 주목하지 않을 수가 없습니다. So that's why we focus on the affiliation, the federation of various people when we talk about the three one movement. 오늘날 우리나라 사람들이 참 연대라는 말을 좋아합니다. 우리나라 대표적인 시민 단체도 참여연대인데요. 이 연대라는 것은 식민지 권력 하에서 식민지 권력 하에서 약자였던 그 한국인들이 어, 서로 함께 어떤 그 저항, 식민 권력의 저항을 할 때는 단독으로 예, 저항을 시작한다 하더라도 결국은 이 국내외에서 어떤 연대가 형성된 이런 문화가 바로 이 3.1 운동부터 시작된 것이라고 볼수 있습니다. Uh, these days uh, we do hear about uh, federation in South Korea. Uh, the best known uh, is the uh, uh, 참여 연대, which is the federation of the participators. And uh, basically, the federation is a concept that the uh, Korean people uh, had uh, when we were under the uh, subjugation of the colonial powers of uh, Japan. Uh, it was a form of resistance, and we couldn't do it on our own, so we would have a federation amongst the uh, different uh, groups. 3.1 운동, 3월 1일 날 보여진 어떤 연대를 보면 먼저 종교 연대가 있을, 있습니다. Uh, the biggest uh, federation, perhaps, was the uh, federation of the religions. 교인의 90% 이상이 북한 지역에 살고 있었던 천도교와 다수의 그 교인들이 북한에 살고 있었던 기독교가 큰 역할을 하게 됩니다. Uh, two of the biggest religions uh, back then had been Chondo and uh, Christianity. Uh, Chondo had about 90% of their believers on the North, North Korean part and also a large number of Christians uh, lived in North Korea as well. 
음, 3월 5일 날 단독 시위를 준비했었던 서울에서의 학생 연대는 학생 그러니까 학교 그 대표들 간의 연대 세력들은 결국 이 3월 1일 만세 시위에도 이제 가담을 하게 되면서 학생 연대도 성립이 됩니다. And also there was the Federation of Students uh, as the various uh, students from different uh, schools uh, came together. 그 다음에 북부 지방의 대부분의 그 기독교인들이 주도해 있던 시위에는 기독교계 학생들이 총 동원이 학생들이 총 동원됐기 때문에 그 종교인과 기, 어, 학생 간의 연대도 이날 있었다고 볼수 있습니다. And also in the northern uh, proper, uh, there were many uh, Christian students. Uh, so you have the uh, Christian religious leaders as well as the students who had been federated uh, or affiliated with one another. 성백시원 3월 1일 날 있었던 일곱 개 도시의 시위는 약자가 절대 강자인 제국주의에 저항을 할때 어떤 가치를 가지고 추구하는 날을 아주 잘 보여준다고 할수 있습니다. And uh, what the uh, three one movement shows is uh, people with no power. Uh, what can they do uh, when they are up against the empire? 예. 어, 저희가 사, 만세 시위라고 보통 부르는 이 만세의 의미 3월 1일에 있었던 만세의 의미에 대해서 한번 정리해 보도록 하겠습니다. Let's go back to the wording manse, the 10,000 years. 어, 3월 1일 날 만세 시위가 일어났던 일곱 군데는 모두 철도역이 지나가는 도시였습니다. The uh, all seven cities uh, where the uh, three one movement uh, occurred uh, were cities uh, where railroad uh, were uh, passing. 일곱 개 도시에서는 전날 배포된 3일 독립 선언서가 모두 낭독되었습니다. In all seven cities the declaration of independence uh, which was distributed the night before had been read. 3월 1일 이후 만세 시위가 확산되는 과정에서도 어, 연대 시위가 3월 1일 보여준 연대 시위가 큰 영향을 미칩니다. And the federated movement among uh, different people uh, was a great inspiration for others uh, to follow. 종교인과 학생은 물론이고 농민 노동자 또는 혹은 이웃과 이웃 마을과 마을이 연대해서 만세 시위를 전개했습니다. Uh, we have the federation of the religious uh, leaders, uh, students, uh, farmers, neighbors. And uh, this was a great federation now. 예, 사람의 연대, 공간의 연대가 두 달이 넘게 이어졌다고 볼수 있습니다. So the federation of people as well as the federation of different locale has occurred together. 그리고 만세 시위는 비폭력 평화 시위였습니다. Of course it was peaceful and no violence. 3일 운동에서 처음부터 폭력 시위를 준비한 경우는 거의 없었습니다. 첫날도 마찬가지였습니다. As it was planned for the first day of March, as well as other days, peace was the mode of operandi. 3일 운동은 항일 운동이었지만 시위대에 의해서 죽은 일본인 민간인은 단한 명도 없었습니다. Uh, this was anti-colonialism uh, movement, uh, but uh, no Japanese had died at the hands of the demonstrators. 여성과 어린이가 참여할 수 있는 비폭력 직접 행동으로서의 만세 시위는 3일 운동이 시작된 첫날부터 어, 등장해서 전국적으로 확산되어 왔습니다. This was a non-violent move, as such, women and children could also participate, and in fact, uh, they did participate. 1919년 3월 1일, 열다섯 살의 나이로 어, 평양에서 기독교계 학생 학교 학, 학교를 다니던 김산이라는 유명한 독립운동가가 있는데요. 그 독립운동가가 이런 말을 남겼습니다. Uh, there is a uh, independent uh, movement uh, fighter uh, who would become a fighter late, later uh, by the name Kim San. At the time of the three one movement in Pyongyang, he was 15 years old. 모든 사람들이 환호했다. All, all people were very excited. 나는 흥분한 나머지 하루 종일 밥 먹는 것도 잊어버렸다. Uh, my excitement was such that I even forgot to eat. 3월 1일에 끼니를 잊은 어, 한국인은 수백만 명이 될 것이다. Uh, there must have been uh, millions of uh, Koreans uh, who even forgot to eat on 3.1. Uh, 이렇게 3월 1일 만세 시위의 의미는 우리가 이제 도시라는 곳이 도시는 근대성을 상징하는 어떤 공간인데요. 그 도시에서 어, 만세 시위가 일어났고 그 다음에 그것이 연대에 의해서 일어났으며 결국 그 시위의 방식은 비폭력 평화 시위였다는 점을 말씀드리고 싶습니다. So uh, what's the significance of a 3.1 uh, movement uh, to us? Well, uh, it occurred in the uh, cities, uh, which uh, symbolizes the modernity or modernness, and also it occurred as a federation, and that it, this was non-violent, a uh, peaceful movement. 예, 이상입니다. 감사합니다. Thank you.
thank you for coming here today. I'd like to thank Professor James Person for inviting me and for organizing this with his uh, students and colleagues. I'm here to talk about a very specific topic, which is uh, print, the role of print in the March 1st movement. Now, uh, as Professor Kim just mentioned, uh, most obviously the organizers had to print uh, 20,000 copies of the Declaration of Independence in secret and distribute it throughout the country. And the importance of print is also shown in the fact that of the 33 signers of the uh, Declaration of Independence, three of them were involved in the print industry, as you can see here, including Yi Zhongil, who was the president of Bosongsa, which was the Chondogyo printing company where, it was, where the Declaration was printed. Now, but modern print was also important to the spread of nationalism. You know, Benedict Anderson's influential book, Imagine Communities, uh, inspired much research on nationalism, nationalism by highlighting the importance of print capitalism on its emergence. He observed that print capitalism made it possible for rapidly growing numbers of people to think about themselves and to relate themselves to others in profoundly new ways. And the March 1st movement provides an opportunity for us to examine his argument in the Korean context. Now, <coughs> Koreans themselves were, of course, aware of this connection between print and nationalism. Uh, if you look at the book, Mechon uh, Yarok by Hwang Hyun, uh, he uh, provides a list of the 15 crimes of Ito Hirobumi that were mentioned by the An Jung Gun at his trial for the assassination of Ito. And among them, you can see things like assassination of Empress Min, the forced signing of the Ulsa Treaty, etc., etc. But number nine is prohib prohibition of subscriptions to newspapers. Now, it doesn't seem as grave as the other ones in, in comparison. But so this goes to show how important they thought print was to the expression of Korean nationalism. So I'll briefly describe the rise of the print industry and its contributions to uh, modern nationalism in Korea. But first, uh, let's look at the term uh, nation. When did the term nation actually enter into discourse in Korea? Now, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, the word nation, minjok, is actually used the most. It's used more than the word independence in the Declaration of Independence. See right here. 13 times. Now, to us today, this might appear to be natural. Of course, they're talking about the minjok, the nation, in the Declaration of Independence. But in its historical context, it was actually surprising, as the use of the term minjok was relatively recent. Now, compared to other terms, uh, the word nation took longer to become established in Korea and was seemingly more difficult to translate. Now, if you look at the Dongnip Shimun, which was the first vernacular newspaper, started publishing in 1896, the term minjok does not appear even once in its editorials. Right? You see, they use more sort of older terms like inmin. Now, you, you, you wouldn't think Koreans use it today because inmin is associated with North Korea. Right? And also beksong, which is an older term, of course. Right? The, the word minjok, uh, from what research I've seen, someone says that he saw it in the Hwang Song Shimun in the year 1900 as the first instance of it. But it really didn't become into more popular use until about after 1904. But even then, it still wasn't used that much. I mean, this is records from the Dehan Meil Shimbo, which is probably considered the most nationalist newspaper in the years leading up to the annexation. And here again, nation, minjok is used, but far less than other words, especially like gungmin or even Dongpo. Like that. The only newspaper that existed with a countrywide circulation after the Japanese takeover was the Meil Shinbo. And yes, the term nation does appear in its pages. From, I haven't taken a close look at it, but generally about from 1913 on, it's, it's used. But it's often used in the sense of race rather than nation. So it really was the Declaration of Independence where that marks the moment when Minjuk became established as meaning the nation. So again, the March 1st movement seems to have everything to do with the, uh, the, the shift to Koreans thinking of, them, of themselves as a nation. Now why? Why did this occur? I mean, there are you know, many reasons for this, but I'm only going to talk about uh, the factors related to print. Now, Koreans are not generally associated with their rapidity, their, their, their skill in information technology, but this is not recent. They were actually extremely adept at adopting modern print, right, which is, of course, the, the IT of the early modern period. Right? 
So, but in contrast to like the development of the smartphone, uh, the development of a print industry faced many obstacles in a colonial or semi-colonial situation. Because of course, the colonized would try to suppress efforts at industrialization. And it was extra difficult to bu build up print because print is a relatively capital intensive industry. It's not, it's not a labor intensive thing where you can just throw lots of cheap labor at it. It needs uh, knowledge and it has somewhat of a high capital outlay, especially initially because of the cost of a printing press, which had to be imported from the West through Japan. Not only that, virtually all supplies, ink and paper, had to be imported, and also through Japan, generally. So this was very costly. So on the other hand, not only expenses were, exp were high, but the potential market was still small because, uh, again, literacy was only about 20% at this time. You know, and colonizers had little interest in giving the colonized easy access to knowledge. So as profit margins were slim, it's not surprising that uh, m many newspapers and m companies failed. But though they were small, and they were sm smaller in scale, much smaller than Japanese companies that were operating uh, in Japan, uh, in Joseon. Now, but these, despite these difficulties, the print industry grew rapidly. Right. The first printing press came into Korea in 1883, imported by the Korean government to produce a government-run newspaper. So w within 40 years of this moment, Koreans was able to produce, mass-produce the Declaration of Independence. Right. See, just a few years later, the Dongdaep Shimun was founded, the first vernacular newspaper, first daily papers in 1898. The circulation of these papers was about the low thousands. Then we got an expansion of newspapers in the years 1904 to 1910. And here, the circulation reaches the high ten thousands, with the Dan Mail Shinbo being, coming, being the most popular one, and at its peak, had a circulation of almost 10,000. And the general trends for the uh, book market were you know, pretty similar. Now, if you look at the statistics from the colonial period, we see, again, a continuing growth of modern print. Uh, you can see here, this is not the statistical yearbook. The statistical yearbook for the government general does not contain information on print, specifically. So I had to go to the provincial, Kyokyo. This is Gyeonggi-do statistics. And, and since print industry was located basically in Seoul, centered in Seoul, I can take it as, as you know, representative of the trends of the country. And you can see here, print suddenly increases a lot right before the March 1st movement in 1917. Why well, don't I have statistics for 1918 and 19? Because of the tremendous chaos produced by the March 1st movement. They didn't produce the, the yearbooks for those periods. And the, as I'll talk about in a moment, the year 1917 was significant. Now, I, I can think of specifically two factors uh, in which print contributed to nationalism, with the emergence of the nation. First is, uh, the growth of print companies was closely connected to the growth of civil society in Korea. Uh, Professor Kim just talked about the tremendous solidarity that existed in the March 1st movement. This was also true between uh, civil society and the print world. So between civil society and what could be called the public sphere. Right? These print companies were established by the new schools, religions, and civic organizations that were established from the late 19th century, and these were, who were also the main leaders of or participants in the March 1st movement. So uh, schools would often have printing departments. So they would teach their students how to use modern print. And these people go and become printers, technicians, intellectuals in the modern print world. And then schools and religions were often the largest markets for modern print. They needed textbooks, et cetera. Uh, the print industry also blurred class boundaries. It became a place where people of different class backgrounds could mix. So people from the Jungin class could mix with Yangban and, and commoner, uh, people commoner background. To give you a few examples of this connection, of course, the Dong Shimon was closely connected with the Independence Club, the first major, major civic organization in Korean history. The Mayo Shimon was founded by uh, students in the debating society of Beje Academy, a kind of Methodist mission school, which had a, a printing department. Hmm? Not surprisingly, they were very involved in the March 1st movement. And, I showed you these newspapers just a moment ago. Again, Mansebo was, of course, the newspaper of the Chondogyo religion. Gyeonghyang Shimun was the, uh, was the newspaper of Catholics. 
Kumin Shinbo is of the pro Japanese group, the Il Jin Hui. And Dian Hyopwe ran his own newspaper, the Han Minbo. So again, print companies were very closely connected with the communities that constituted the social base of modern nationalism. So it's not surprising that a good part of the conflict between Japan and Korea in the years up to 1910 played out in the print world. Now, the second factor is that the print industry promoted the use of the vernacular language, of course. As Benedict Anderson has argued, the revolutionary uh, vernacularizing thrust of capitalism was one of the main factors in the emergence of the nation. So Professor Yoon talked about how uh, the March First movement was revolutionary. One other factor, uh, cultural factor, is the spread of the vernacular. Um, Korea was no different. Print companies contributed much to the development of the vernacular. And one of the first institutes devoted to research on the Korean language was actually located in the offices of the Dongnip Shinmun. And its head was the pioneering linguist Zhu Shigyang. Another company that contributed uh, to the development of the link of vernacular was Shinmun Guan, which was founded by one of the largest print companies of the uh, pre March 1st era. Uh, Shinmun Guan was founded by Chen Nam Sun, a pioneering poet, in 1907. So it published journals that had a number of articles on the vernacular. Uh, Shin Meng Guan also published one of the first grammar books of Korean, which was written by Ju Xi Gyeong, who was a regular visitor to the offices of the Shin Meng Guan. Now, they were trying to solve the problem of establishing a standard grammar for the written language, and one that set, had to set the proper la level of respect that a writer has to address to a reader. Now, you know, on one hand, this is purely economic driven. You know, newspapers want to reach the largest market possible, and the vernacular language was the best way to do that. But it also changes the way you experience a text when it's written in the vernacular language. Vernacular writing grounded in ph phonetics privileges voice over text. So it, it, it enables what has been called the discovery of interiority by Karatani Kojin. This sense of interiority is, was what was necessary to capture the individual experience as found in the novel. This is why the first modern novels are published in newspapers. And then this also gave expression to the collective interiority that we call national consciousness. Now, we can demonstrate this very quickly uh, through Yi Guangsu's novel, Wuzhou. Now, the statistics I showed you earlier showed a sudden increase in the quantity of print in the year 1917. And this was a significant uh, year in the history of modern print. So this is the year that Yi Guangsu began serializing it. He literally began on January 1st, 1917. And this was a turning point in literary and cultural history. It was written entirely in the vernacular, representing a qualitative leap in its development. Many of its innovations are still used today, ending in you know, da, ganda, handa. You, you, you see it here. It also marked a shift from dramas and oral performance to novels as the principal form of cultural consumption of urban elites. Now, before this, novels would be used as materials for performances. Now we see the reverse. You know, or, or uh, sorry, I mean, uh, plays would be used as material for novels before 1970. But now, novels are the center. The novels are generally turned into dramas. Right? Now, so this suggests that, together, you know, together with the statistics I showed you earlier, this suggests that the publication of Mujong represented the beginning of a modern reading public. And a modern re reading public is, of course, necessary for nationalism, modern nationalism. Now, the novel is what, to, you know, what people today would call meta, because it can be read as a story of young people acquiring a national identity. This is something that the, the readers of the novel themselves were acquiring at the time. Now, the novel provides a wealth of material to examine the relationship of print to nationalism, but let me restrict myself to a quick discussion of the ending. Now, sorry I'm spoiling the ending, but this came out over 100 years ago, so, so you've had plenty of time to try to read this novel. Now, the main characters are all riding on a train when it is stopped due to flooding, and they see farmers who are uh, escaping the flood and are now suddenly homeless, and they go to help them. They help a, a pregnant peasant woman give birth, etc then they hold an impromptu music concert to raise money for them. Now, what's interesting about the ending is how precise Yi Guangsu is about narrating when they acquired a national identity. He said that the sorrow of the farmer's plight was not enough to make them nationalists. They're, they're sorry about that, but uh, that feeling dissipated. 
It was only after they performed the concert that they became committed nationalists. So why is this so? In other words, at the concert they performed a song about the plight of the peasantry. So in other words, these main characters transformed into nationalists when their relationship to the people became mediated by text, by print, by word. That is, when their relationship became, in Benedict Anderson's terms, imagined. So they don't have a relation, direct relationship with these people. These people are now a symbol of the nation to them. After the serialization was completed, it was published, not surprisingly, by Chen Namsen's company, Shimungwa. Again, showing the tight connection between the print world and uh, civil society. And it's not surprisingly that the novel roughly coincides with the emergence of the term nation in discourse. It is almost like a foreboding of the March 1st movement. Now, to conclude, I just want to talk about the two print companies that were most important to the March 1st movement. Now, these were Shin Guan and Bo Song Sa. In both their backgrounds and activities, they reflected trends of their time and helped to explain why the print industry was able to grow. Now, they were the most successful of the small-scale Korean companies that were founded before the March 1st movement. As I mentioned, uh, Shin Meng-gwan was founded by Chen nam son who was a member of the Jungin class. His family were interpreter Jungin. And because they were interpreters, they went to China a lot. They became involved in the book trade. Right? So, when he, he was studying at Waseda University in, in Japan, he left it after one term. When he came back, he bought a printing press because his father was quite wealthy. He bought a printing press, took Japanese technicians with him, and returned to Seoul. He didn't know how to operate them. It took them almost two years to figure out how to operate it. They opened it in 1907. Right. Bo Song Sa was a company founded by Yi yong -ik that was later taken over by the Chondogyo religion in 1910. Now, Remember, Chondyogyo just a few years ago had been a forbidden religion. It was suppressed, but from the early 20th century, it became a leading force in modernization. Right? Now, these were all sort of small companies. You know, the statistics show that, again, capitalization, you know, 35,000, Bosung Sai, even smaller. The Japanese newspapers in Seoul, so there was the Keijo Nippo, was about, had a capitalization of about 100,000 yen. So again, not even one-third the size of a Japanese company at the time. But they became successful. Shin Meng Guan became successful by publishing affordable novels known as the Yukjon Sosur, you know, six Jun Sosur uh, translations and old Korean texts. He founded a, 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 a society called the Joseon Gwangmunhui, which sought out old texts from the Joseon period and reprinted them. Bo Song Sa satisfied the Chondogyo religion's need for print, including publishing its monthly bulletin. Now, both companies were involved in the March 1st movement by printing the Declaration of Independence. You know, as is well known, Che Nam Son wrote the draft of the Declaration, then he reviewed the draft with members of the Chondogo religion to produce the final version. Now, after the draft was done, it was typeset at his company, the Shin Meng then the plate was brought to Bo Song Sa, but the Shin Meng plate proved to be unusable after a while, so they made a new one. So there are actually two versions. The wording and the content is the same, but the, the printing is different. You can tell the Bo Song Sa one because in the first line, they spelled the name of the country wrong. So Jo Sun was spelled Son Jo in the Bo Song Sa edition. That's how you can tell. But, and they printed 20,000 copies in less than you know, a day, apparently in four hours. Now, I point out these differences because they illustrate the difference between the two companies. You see here Bo Song Sa, Printed in sort of a traditional way. That's right, no, no separation of the words, not the easiest thing to read in the world, even for, for us today. If you look at the Shimun Guan, I don't know if you can see it so clearly, but it has what Koreans call diosugi. The words are separated. Now, it's in a style that's closer to what we would see as modern Korean, modern Hangul. So again, this is not surprising because Shimun Guan was closer with the researchers who were uh, working on the Korean language. So they used a more modern style in there. Yeah. Some say this was produced first, but this actually corrects typos that were in the Bo Song Sa edition. They don't exist here. Like Korea is spelled correctly in every, Joseon is spelled correctly in every place in this, in this version. So I'm not sure which one was actually printed first. But the difference between the two, I think, s sort of captures how the March 1st movement marked a transition in textual practices from, yes, or less, from a pre-modern to a modern one.
And these were the textual practices that were essential for the rise of modern nationalism in Korea. Right. Thank you very much. Great, I want to thank uh, our three presenters for uh, excellent presentations, um, very enlightening. <coughs> Mike, was Chain Up's son really 17 when he did this, when he founded the company? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. But almost all, all people involved in the print industry were surprisingly very young. Yeah. Like, Kim Song Soo was in his 30s when he owned, you know, the Dong Yeah, yeah. They're all very young. Yes. Um, we have uh, um, just, just about half an hour for, um, uh, for Q&A, uh, so I will open open the floor and, and just wait for the mic. 한 30분이 있기 때문에 우선 Q&A를 하도록 하겠습니다. Wait for the mic and uh, uh, identify yourself, please. Um, right over here. Nope. No. Is it not on? Manchuria, there he discusses about the usage of Minjok by Shin Cheo, and you know, so uh, to me, I thought it was way more uh, widespread and used before the period that you just showed, the, you know, the research that you conducted, the data that, that you showed. I can't exactly remember uh, the number now, but uh, it was it used way less than, less, you know, the other terms such as like Inmin, Pekstong, uh, or even Tongpo. And so then my question is, um, then, uh, in the declaration, we see more usage of minjo. And so my question would be, why is that? Why, is, why at this particular moment in 1919 that they decided to use the term minjo? Because for me, like, you know, minjo was, um, it is a modern concept that emerged at the turn of the 20th century, and it was more widespread before that. <laughs> but, it, I mean, your research shows you know, uh, something else. So I would be curious to know uh, more about their understanding of Minjok at the time and why in 1919 they decided to use Minjok rather than other words. Uh, why don't we take another, another uh, question or two. Um, right here. Uh, hi, my name is Chung An Choi uh, from National Archive. Uh, so I have questions about the because I got the primary education in South Korea, but I didn't know that many the independence movement was in the north northern pro, pro, uh, in North North Korea part. So I wonder because the uh, in South Korea the Samirundong is most biggest uh, historic event, but uh, I wonder that in North Korea also they are considering the Samir Undong as a, the most important history events because when I search uh, some documents of, uh, of the Department of State, uh, most of the document was the report was recognized was reported in Gyeongsang or Pyongyang. So that's why I wonder. Yeah, this is my question. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Shin, uh, so they printed 20,000 of these. How did they manage to distribute them, particularly since I've learned from this that the revolution began in seven different cities? So were they printed in seven different cities or just in one and they some, 
And clearly this had to be covertly done. You couldn't just be peddling him out on the uh, street. No. And then uh, presumably this story did not have a happy ending, that they must have found out who was responsible for the printing of them and took retributive action. Wait, let's start with those three questions. Okay. Uh, 우선은 마이클 김, uh, 마이클 신 교수님한테 uh, 질문이 두 개가 있었습니다. Uh, 첫 번째는 그 민족이라고 한 단어에 대해서 uh, 질문이 있었죠. 조지 와싱턴의 김지수 교수님이 물어보셨는데 uh, 실질적으로 그렇게 uh, 인민이나 백성 동포보다 uh, 민족이라고 한 단어가 늦게 시작이 됐는지 uh, 그리고 그 사실은 그 개념 자체는 상당히 20세기적인데. 언제부터 그렇게 활용이 되기 시작했는지 어, 마이클 신 교수님한테 아울러서 또 질문이 나왔는데 2만 부를 어, 프린트를 했다 그랬는데 인쇄된 것이 어떻게 배포가 된 것인지 일곱 개 도시에서 동시다발적으로 어, 혁명적인 활동이 일어나기 위해서는 배포가 신속히 이루어졌어야 되는데 여러 군데서 인쇄가 된 것이 실질적으로 아니면 한 군데서 인쇄가 되어서 어떤 식으로든지 배포가 된 것인지 어, 아울러서 어, 인쇄를 했던 회사들은 어떤 식으로든지 보복을 당했을 것 같은데 어떤 결과들을 낳았는지 어, 그리고 최정환 씨 내셔널 아카이브에서 일을 하고 계시는 분인데 어, 독립운동에 대해서 여쭤보는데 3일 운동이 대한민국에서 배울 때는 남한에서 주로 일어난 것처럼 어, 공부가 되었는데 실제적으로 오늘 이야기를 들어보니까 북한에서 더 많이 거국적으로 이루어졌다고 말씀을 하셨는데 어, 그럴 경우에는 어, 역사적으로 어, 우리가 대한민국에서는 이것을 기념을 하는데 북한에서도 역시 기념을 하는지 어떤 행사들이 있는지 Okay. Uh, to answer the questions, uh, first about the distribution of the Declaration of Independence. I mean, they cut it very close. It was printed on February 27th. Right? And, but then it was distributed through uh, giving it to students and they went on you know, the railroads. Uh, Records at the time show that because of the funeral of the Gojom, you know, the second to last uh, em emperor, uh, about 5,000 people were arriving in Seoul daily to attend the funeral. So there was a tremendous number of people riding on railroads. So they could have uh, hidden. Uh, they could have done it covertly by doing it. So that's why, as Professor Kim Jong-un just talked about, the earliest demonstrations occurred along the railroad in cities on the, on the main railway line. And yes, there was an, indeed retribution in the end. Uh, Bosongsa, which is where um, the main body was printed, and it was centrally done. The Korean flags, the printing of Korean flags was not centrally done. It was done all over. But the Declaration of Independence itself was centrally done. And the Japanese um, uh, burned down the Bosongsa in, in, in the course of the March 1st movement. Yeah. 어, 다만 이제 보성사는 이 사건이 일어나고 나서 어, 불태워진 것으로 알려져 있습니다. And to answer uh, Professor Kim's uh, question about the use of the term minjo, I guess uh, Shin Jae Ho was pretty early at at at, at using it. Like he was talking about uh, he talked about like a spiritual history. He, he shifted the discussion of history to spiritual factor. So if you look at someone who is his contemporary like like a he doesn't use minjo. He calls it gukon and gukbe. Right. So uh, Shincho was pretty early in establishing it, but the veil meishimbo is a little bit uh, extreme and is non-use of it. Yes, so yes, it was used as early as like in the early 1900s period, but uh, no matter what source you look at, it really increases from the year 1909. And the people uh, I've read speculate that that's when the takeover of the, company of the country became clear. So they didn't think they could see themselves as a gumin anymore. So they had to think of themselves as a more spiritual entity of a nation. So we also see this during the colonial period when the word gumin disappears from discourse uh, during the colonial period and minjuk as much because again there's no country. So minjuk was the term that most it becomes very associated with loss of the country specifically, not just the spiritual principle of, of the nation. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
신재호 씨 같은 경우는 이제 민족이라는 단어를 1919년 전에서부터 쓰기 시작하셨던 분이고 박근식 같은 분은 이제 국호원이나 국배 같은 그런 단어 예, 네, 다른 어, 용어를 어, 쓰고는 하셨는데, 여하튼 그 한국인들의 정신적인 역사에 있어서 어, 1900년대 초부터 어, 민족이라고 하는 단어가 쓰여졌다고 보여지고요. 실질적으로 이것이 더 많이 쓰여진 것은 1919년부터라고 하는 것이 옳다고 생각을 합니다. 어, 그리고 민족하고 이제 비슷한 개념으로 국민이 있는데, 국민은 역시 나라가 있는 사람들이기 때문에. 식민지 사가 식민지 하에서는 국민이라고 하는 단어가 많이 사용되지 않았다라고 보겠습니다. 그 내가 좀 얘기 네. 얘기 좀 했대. 네. 어 삼일 <웃음> 운동이 그 남한에서 주로 일어난 걸로 알았는데 오늘 발표를 보니까. 북쪽에서 많이 일어났다 이제 그런 생각이 든다 그런 질문이었죠. So uh, yeah, your question was uh, that uh, you thought uh, that the uh, three one movement was mostly limited to South Korea, but now you learn uh, today that it uh, was actually more widespread in North Korea, correct? Then yes. 어 그거는 그 동안 70년 동안 남북이 분단되면서 남쪽은 남쪽 중심의 역사 연구가 이루어졌고 북쪽은 북쪽대로 그러니까 이걸 이제 우리 한국에서 그걸 분단 사학이라고 그래요 분단 그러니까 분단돼 있기 때문에 역사에 대한 정통성 시비라든지 역사에 대한 주체 문제 이런 거를 남쪽은 남쪽 중심으로 북쪽은 북쪽 중심으로 예를 들면 삼일 운동도 우리 남쪽에서는 이렇게 높이 평가하지만 쪽에 서 나온 어, 조선 통사나 어, 조선 전사나 어, 또 조선 민족 운동사나 북쪽에서 나온 책들 이런 데는 삼일 운동을 삼일 봉기라고 하는데 이 삼일 봉기는 실패했다 왜 당과 수령의 지도력이 없었기 때문에 실패했다 이렇게 해서 말하자면 실패한 부르주아 운동으로. 이렇게 역사적으로 낮춰 놓고 있습니다. 이게 너무 길게. Yeah, so it, uh, it really depends on uh, who uh, you ask actually. Uh, there is the uh, idea of a divided historical thinking. Uh, basically South Koreans are South Korean centric when it comes to the history of the past 70 years and the same goes with North Korea. They would be North Korean centric. Uh, basically the each uh, government is trying to provide the legitimacy uh, uh, from the history. In South Korea, we do uh, evaluate uh, three one movement as uh, something that was very important in our history. However, if you were to look at the history books of North Korea, such as uh, uh, Choson uh, Tongsa, Jeonsa, and uh, Choson uh, Minjok Undongsa, uh, these are some of the textbooks that they use. And the three one movement is described as a uh, three one uh, riot or uh, resurrection uh, of a three one. And uh, this is uh, deemed uh, to have been a failure because it was not led uh, by the party uh, nor the great leader. So that's how they uh, give uh, legitimacy to the government. Uh, 가지만 더 얘기를 하면 삼일 uh, 운동의 국내 봉기 국내에서 일어나된 직접적인 음, 그 배경은 고종 황제의 죽음인데 이분이 그해 19년 1월 21일 날 돌아갔어요. 그렇게 하고는 지방에서는 이제 문상객이 오는데 이때 기록을 보면 남대문역에 2월 27일 에는 5천 명인가 왔고 지방에서 각지에서 그때 그, 그 기차가 있었기 때문에 어, 그리고 28일 날에는 어, 8천 명인가 온 걸로 돼서 서울 시내에 어, 그러니까 서울에 각 지방에서 올라온 유림들이 그 문상을 온 사람들이 아주 많았습니다. 또 하나는 yeah, 당시에 so, uh, the, uh, on January 21st, uh, the uh, Emperor uh, Ko uh, had uh, passed away, and with his uh, passage, uh, there were many people uh, who were coming to Seoul uh, uh, to commemorate his uh, death at, in consolation. 
And there was, uh, according to some of the records, uh, on uh, February 27th, uh, 5,000 people who have come to Seoul. And then on the next date, uh, there were 8,000 people uh, who were uh, in Seoul. Uh, they were passing through the south uh, gate. 그 다음에 그 일제의 그 비밀 그 보고서에 보면 전라도와 경상도조에게 유림들 중에는 나라를 빼앗긴 왕이 죽었다고 하는데 뭐하러 문상을 가느냐 이러한 반응도 상당히 있었습니다. And uh, based on uh, some of the confidential documents uh, from the uh, Imperial uh, Japan, uh, there were apparently some uh, scholars in uh, the provinces of Jeolla and uh, Gyeongsang uh, who had uh, the opinion that uh, the emperor that had passed away uh, was the emperor who lost uh, the uh, uh, nation uh, to the Japanese. Why do we have to uh, sympathize with his uh, death? Yeah, the, uh, 독립선언서의 배포와 관련해서는 2월 27일 날 보성사에서 2만 1000매를 인쇄해서 2월 28일 날 천도교인과 기독교인과 불교계의 그 학생과 그 지도자들이 전국으로 배포를 했습니다. As to the uh, printing of the declaration, uh, it is correct. On February 27th, uh, 보성사 uh, printed 22,000 declarations and uh, they were distributed on the 28th uh, by the uh, students and leaders of uh, Chondo, uh, Christian and Buddhism. 어, 그리고 혹시 도착하지 않을 것에 대비해서 평안북도 선천과 의주에서는 어, 2월 28 2월, 2월 8일 날 도쿄에서 어, 유학생들이 인쇄했던 독립 선언서를 어, 미리 인쇄를 해 놓고 있었습니다. And then there were concerns uh, in the uh, cities of Sancheon and Uju of the uh, Pyongan uh, Bukdo uh, that uh, perhaps these uh, declarations would not arrive timely. And as such, they also had declarations uh, printed by the students uh, who were from uh, Tokyo at the time. 3월 1일부터 5일 사이에 100곳이 넘는 곳에서 독립선언서가 발견된 것은 어, 서울에서 배포한 것도 있지만 각 학교나 교회가 가지고 있던 인쇄기 등사기를 활용해서 바로 프린트를 했기 때문에 가능했던 일입니다. Uh, between uh, March 1st and March 5th, uh, in about uh, 100 locations, uh, the declaration was found, and this was indicated of uh, printing that were done in different uh, places, uh, such as the churches and uh, schools, and uh, these were the printings that were owned uh, by these uh, smaller facilities. 예, 이 말씀을 드리는 것은 아까 마이클 선생님이 말씀하셨던 부분에서 조금 더 문제 의식을 확장시켜 보면 이 일본이 조선 총독부가 말하기를 그이 선전문을 인쇄하는 것이 3.1 운동 확산에 가장 결정적인 그 역할을 했다라고 일본 그러니까 일본 총독 조선 총독부가 인정하고 있기 때문에 그 마이클 선생님의 문제 의식이 굉장히 중요합니다. 예. I think uh, something very important was pointed out by uh, Michael Shin. Uh, because the, uh, the printing itself was uh, quite pivotal uh, in the spread of the movement throughout the peninsula. And uh, this was something that was recognized uh, by the Japanese uh, rulers at the time. So the printing was an important factor in the movement. 예 그리고 두 번째로 북한에서는 40주년까지는 책을 낼 정도로 굉장히 그 50년대까지 40주니까 50년대 1950년대까지는 북, 어, 북한에서 3.1 운동을 굉장히 중요하게 다루다가 어, 어, 김일성 어떤 독재 체제 강화가 이루어지면서 예, 점점 그 3.1 운동에 대해서는 예, 저기 어떤 그 역사적인 평가를 좀 낮게 해 가면서 최근에는 어, 김일성의 아버지가 3일, 평양의 3.1 운동을 이끌었고 김일성도 6살, 8살의 나이로 참여했다라는 걸 강조하고 있습니다. And uh, in North Korea, as to the uh, commemoration of the 3 1 movement, uh, it was actually a big event uh, up until the uh, 1950s. Uh, we know that uh, in the 50s uh, that there was a 40th uh, year uh, anniversary uh, book uh, that was published in North Korea. But since then, the evaluation has gone down. 
and that the three one movement was not considered as important in the history of uh, North Korea. Uh, that's because uh, this was not, again, not led by the uh, party uh, nor by the great leader. Uh, however, uh, there had been some uh, writings in North Korea indicating uh, that uh, Kim Il sung's uh, father uh, was actually uh, somehow involved uh, in the uh, movement. 예, 그리고 세 번째로 마이클 신 선생님한테 질문이 들어온 건데 제가 보충 설명을 해 드리면 이 민족이라는 단어가 독립 선언서에 많이 나오기는 하는데 실제로 그 이후로 일제 시기에 그렇게 많이 쓰이지는 않았습니다. So I differ a bit with Michael Shin's statement as to the word uh, minjok. Uh, I do agree uh, that this occur, uh, disappeared in the uh, declaration, uh, but uh, I do not agree that the word uh, was uh, widely used after uh, the 1919. 제가 조사한 바에 따르면 국민이라는 단어가 많이 쓰였는데 두 가지 용례로 쓰였습니다. Uh, in fact, uh, I, according to my research, uh, the wording uh, "gukmin" uh, was actually used uh, more. 첫 번째는 일본의 제국의 신민이라는 뜻, 뜻에서 황국 신민이라는 말에서 나오는 그런 국민이 많이 쓰였으니까 일본의 통치하에 있는 사람이라는 의미로 그 국민이라는 단어를 국내에서는 많이 썼습니다. Uh, the uh, wording uh, gukmin uh, loosely translated as nation's people uh, was actually a short form of the uh, 한국 신민, uh, which was a reference by the Japanese imperialist uh, to all people who were under the uh, rule of Japan. So uh, when the Japanese people wanted to refer to the people who were under their rule, they would say 국민. 중국의 상하이에서 출발했던 그 대한민국 임시 정부의 경우에도 당연히 그 자국민을 불러야 되기 때문에 국민이란 단어, 그러니까 그 국민이란 단어를 더 많이 썼습니다. And in a uh, different uh, way, uh, the uh, provisional government of uh, Korea, which was established in Shanghai, also used the word uh, "국민" uh, to refer to the Korean people. 그런데 임시정부가 국민보다 더 많이 쓴 단어는 인민입니다. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the word that was used more often than uh, "국민" uh, by the provisional government was "인민," um, also meaning people. 임시정부가 다섯 번에 걸쳐서 개헌을 하면서도 계속 그 주체를 예, 대한민국의 인민으로 예, 주체를 불렀었습니다. Because the provisional government did have five different revisions to the constitution, and in each of the constitution there was a reference to inmin, the people. 모든 자료를 다본건 아니지만 오히려 해방 이후에 반일을 강조하면서 민족이라는 단어를 훨씬 많이 쓴게 아닌가 하는 게제 생각입니다. So, uh, although I have not looked at all the documents, obviously, uh, but I believe uh, the, uh, the wording uh, 민족 uh, was uh, becoming more prevalent after the liberation was given. Uh, this was in a way an anti-Japanese sentiment that was being reflected. Mike, did you want to... Oh, no. oh, I mean, uh, I'm glad that uh, first has given a bit, a bit more detail on it, but yes, yeah, I mean, these things happen. Like, like the term, you hear people say that the term balgengi or red, you know, kami was not used during the colonial period. Then you also hear people say that the term kami was used in the colonial period. What is it? That Koreans generally did not use it amongst themselves, but the Japanese government used it to refer to any nationalists uh, uh, as communists. So it was, and it depends on who's using it. You know, the state is one thing, the, the Korean, what Koreans are using, about themselves is a different thing. Yeah, so differences will appear in this process. 네, yeah, yeah. 김 교수님하고 조금 뭐 차이가 있는데요. Yeah. 뭐 단어 뭐 빨갱이 같은 단어도 사실은 식민지 시절에는 쓰여지지 않았다고 하는 사람들이 있는가 하면은 또 일본 어, 제국은 어, 한국에 있는 아, 죄송합니다. 이, 하, 한반도에 있는 모든 그 반체제주의자를 빨갱이라고 불렀다고 하는 그런 기록들이 있습니다. 아까, 예. 아, 그런 것을 볼때 어, 정부 입장에서 보느냐 어, 아니면 사람들 입장에서 보느냐 표현 차이가 있다고 보고 있습니다. 제가 참고로 어, 이렇게 또 오셨는데 그래도 삼일 운동에 대해서 조금 더 어, 이해를 하셔야 된다는 면에서 한두 가지만 더 말씀을 드리겠습니다. And if I may add uh, just uh, two uh, ideas to the movement uh, three one. 아, 이 삼일 운동이 이렇게 거적적으로 전국적으로 일어날 수 있었던 데는 또 그리고 이 독립심 아, 독립 선언문을 이렇게 인쇄해서 배포하고 이런 일을 하는 데는 뭐니 뭐니 해도 제일 중요한 게 돈입니다. 돈을 자금을 어떻게 만들었느냐 그에 대해서 조금 말씀드리겠습니다. 
And uh, what is true now is also true, was also true back then, uh, for the 3 1 movement uh, to be uh, occurring simultaneously throughout uh, different uh, regions and also be able to be printed uh, for a large uh, quantity, uh, there was a need for money, and I would like to talk about the money. 어, 결론부터 말씀드리면 이 3일 독립운동의 자금은 기독교가 아니라 천도교 쪽에서 전적으로 다 나왔습니다. And I would dare say all funding came not from the Christianity but from a 천도 religion. 당시 천도교 교세는 어, 헌미, 그러니까 지금 교회에서 말하는 헌금을 하는 교인이 300만 명이 이렇다고 합니다. And uh, it is said uh, that there were about three million believers of a Chondo religion uh, who were contributing uh, to the church. Uh, 1906, 이때 마침 어, 1918년 19년 요때 천도 교당을 짓기 위해서 어, 그때 갖고 있었던 돈만 100만 원그 당시 돈이 100만 원입니다. 100만 원이면 지금 그게 어, 하여튼 뭐 100억 정도는 되지 않을까 싶은데 그 정도의 돈을 어, 갖고 있었습니다. Uh, in 1906, uh, 손병희 uh, became the founding uh, minister of a Chondo religion, uh, which actually uh, came from uh, Donghak uh, religion uh, before. And uh, during 1918 and 1919, uh, the Chondo religion uh, wanted to uh, open a new uh, sanctuary. And for that sanctuary, they have collected about one million won back then, uh, which would be equivalent to about uh, 10 billion Korean won now. 그러니까 당시 기독교는 어, 23만을 넘지 못했습니다. 그러니까 천도교인의 10분의 1도 안 됐습니다. 교세가. At the time, uh, the believers in Christianity were uh, about uh, two, uh, 23,000, uh, 230,000, uh, which was uh, less than 10% of the believers in uh, 천도 uh, religion. 그 실제로 이 3일 운동이 기독교와 천도교가 연대해서 어, 했을 때도 기독교 측에서 사실 이, 그, 이 운동을 위한 자금을 5천 원을 원래 3천 원 정도 요구를 했는데 에, 3천에서 5천 원을 달라고 했는데 천도교 손병희 교주가 아, 5천 원을 현찰을 줬습니다. Uh, so uh, as uh, was spoken of earlier. Uh, the federation was between the Christianity and uh, Chondo, and uh, at the time uh, there was a request uh, from the movement uh, that there should be between uh, 3,001 uh, to 5,001 uh, given uh, to the movement, and uh, Son uh, gave actually 5,001 in cash. 오늘날은 천도교 교세가 굉장히 낮고 기독교가 한국에서 굉장히 커져 있기 때문에 에, 이제 역현상이 낮지만은. 1919년 현재는 천도교의 교세나 또 자금이나 이런 것이 상당히 에, 컸던 것은 역사적 사실입니다. Uh, Christianity has uh, grown uh, since then and it is much bigger uh, than uh, Chondo uh, religion in Korea now. However, 100 years ago that was the other uh, way uh, and the uh, Chondo religion had been quite uh, a big uh, influence in the Korean uh, psyche back then. 다른 하나는 어, 이 어, 김이 독립 선언문 이거를 천남선이 썼는데 어, 이거의 텍스트가 된 거는 이에 앞서서 동경에서 2월 8일 날 그러니까 2월 어, 1월 말에 작, 작성됐던 어, 이팔 독립 선언문이 송계백이라곤 하는 <웃음> 천도 교인이 그걸 갖고 국내 <웃음> 잠입해서 그거를 최남선이 어, 먼저 봤습니다. And uh, it is widely known uh, that uh, Choi Nam-sun had authored uh, the uh, Declaration of Independence. Uh, 
Uh, however, that text uh, is uh, something that came from Tokyo. Uh, towards the end of uh, January, uh, there was a declaration that was being drafted in Tokyo, and it was announced uh, on uh, February 8th in Tokyo. And there was a uh, Chando believer uh, who, by the name Song Ge Baek, uh, had uh, brought this uh, to uh, Korea. 그래서 이 이팔 독립 선언문에 보면 민족이라는 어, 단어가 많이 나오고 조선이라는 단어와 대한이라는 단어가 같이 혼용해서 써져 있습니다. In the uh, two eight uh, declaration, uh, we see that the wording 민족 uh, is uh, shown quite a bit, and also the wording uh, 조선 and also 대한 had been used interchangeably. 이런 용어들이 최남선이 최종적으로 작성한 김이 독립 선언서에 반영되었다고 봐야 될 것입니다. I think it is correct to see Chenamson's declaration as having been influenced heavily by the 2.8 declaration. Um, question there. 저는 KDI 대학원을 은퇴한 이계우 교수입니다. 이게 들어보니까 오늘 새로운 걸 많이 배우게 되는데 특히 인상적인 것은 서울 탑골공원에서 3일 운동이 일어났다 이렇게만 배우고 이렇게만 이해해 왔는데 사실상 첫 오가나이저들이 일곱 개의 그 여섯 개의 북한 도시에서. 주로 일어났다는 것이 아주 새로운 것 같습니다. 그래서 그거 왜 그런가? 그게 뭐 이북 사람들이 어, 이리 오가나이징 스킬이 특별히 좋은 건가? 그래서 공산당도 잘 오가나이즈하고 <웃음> 이렇게 하는 것처럼 그런 어, 이런 어, 기질이 있는 건가? 이리 생각도 해보고 다른 하나는 어, 이게 천도기가 돈을 많이 대했지만도 대부분 활동한 사람들은 학생들이고. 그 학생들은 대부분 그 당시에는 어, 기독교 학교들의 학생들인 걸로 기억을 합니다. 그래서 그런 학생들이 에, 주로 오가나이징 하는 운동의 주체였기 때문에 어, 그 기독교 학교가 이북에 많이 있었고 이남에는 많이 없었기 때문에 그런 것이 아닌 건가 어, 이런 생각이 드는데 어떻게 생각하시는지 에, 궁금합니다. 윤 교수님, 김 교수님. 예. 그뭐 사실 사실입니다. 어, 북쪽에는 이제 첫날 한그 대표적인 학교 이제 신성 학교인데 그거는 뭐 기독교 미션 스쿨이죠. 그 거길 비롯해서 어, 북쪽에서 이렇게 일어난 실제로 그 시위를 많이 한 사람들은 기독교고 그리고 이제 그건 결과에 에, 그 구속된 사람들 피해를 입은 장소. 이런 것들이 지금 현재 통계에 나와 있는 걸 보면 은 그렇게 교세는 당시에 적었지만 은 천도교나 불교나 다른 데보다도 교회당이라든지 기독교 학교라든지 이런 데가 훨씬 피해가 많고 또그 구속된 사람들의 종교를 분류해 놓은 걸 봐도 기독교가 기독교 쪽이 천도교나 다른 쪽보다 훨씬 더 많은 거로 현재 이렇게 잡혀 있습니다. 물론 단 여기 천도교에 대한 연구가 지금 충분히 안돼 있습니다. 그렇기 때문에 그런 쪽에 대한 연구가 앞으로 더 돼야 된다는 조구, 그 전제는 있어야 될 거예요. 그러나 지금 현재까지 연구된 걸로 봐서는 피해 입은 곳도 피해 입은 장소도 또 구속된 분들도 대개 기독교인들이 훨씬 더 많은 것으로 돼 있습니다. So the question was posed by uh, Professor Dehol. Uh, Lee uh, retired uh, from KDI and the uh, question was as follows. Uh, uh, we have uh, known and studied uh, that uh, 3 one movement uh, was uh, in uh, Tapkol uh, Park. Uh, we didn't realize until today that it actually it was organized throughout uh, Korea and in particular in the uh, six additional cities of uh, North Korea. I wonder why all these organizations uh, were taking place in North Korea. Uh, are North Koreans uh, naturally better at organizing? Or is it because there were more uh, Christian uh, schools in North Korea and the students were the uh, main body of the uh, movement, although the funding may have come from Chondo uh, belief? 
uh, response uh, was as follows uh, from uh, uh, Professor Yoon. Uh, it is correct uh, that there were more missionary schools uh, in uh, North Korea. And in, in fact, uh, there was uh, one uh, missionary school known as Shinsong, uh, which uh, had uh, been uh, a, an important force in the movement. And uh, it was actually a target of uh, retaliation afterward. And uh, most of the people who were involved, in fact, uh, who were doing the demonstration were uh, Christian uh, students. And as such, uh, after the fact uh, that it was uh, more of Christians and uh, Christian students uh, who were uh, taken into custody and that uh, churches and uh, missionaries uh, had been also uh, affected uh, more heavily uh, than uh, the uh, Chondo uh, facilities. And also, uh, we need to do more studies as into the Chondo religion uh, to really see what happened uh, to the religious uh, affiliations of uh, the people involved. Yeah. 그 북한 지역에서 천도교가 기독교인들이 많았던 이유는 어, 북한 지역은 조선 시대 전통적인 소외 지역이었습니다. 정치적 차별을 받던 곳이었습니다. Well, uh, it is true. Uh, in the old days, uh, in the north, uh, north proper, uh, that there would be more uh, Chondo and uh, Christian uh, believers. Uh, that's because it was also an outcast uh, for a long time in the Korean history. Uh, 그 그러나 경제적으로는 조선 후기부터 남부 지 남부 지역보다 훨씬 잘 살았습니다. 지금하고 반대입니다. 네. However, economic wise, uh, North uh, part uh, had uh, later uh, towards the end of uh, Joseon uh, dynasty uh, became a stronger uh, uh, part uh, than South. Uh, so it's the reverse of how it is now. 조선의 권력으로부터 배제당한 북부 지방 사람들이 가장 적극적으로 서양 문명을 받아들였습니다. Uh, because the North Koreans uh, were uh, an outcast and who did not share in the governing party of uh, Choson, uh, they were actually more uh, turning their eyes uh, towards outside. 기독교도 어, 목사님이 와서 서양 목사님이 와서 전파한 게 아니고 의주에 있었던 상인들이 중국에 건너가서 직접 목사 안수를 받고 와서 활동을 했습니다. Uh, for example, uh, Christianity, the way it spread in North Korea was not through the missionaries uh, from outside, uh, but the merchants uh, who went to China uh, from North Korea and who had become uh, anointed as the uh, ministers and came back and Christianized the North Koreans. 북쪽, 북부지방의 주요 도시에는 그래서 교회와 기독교계 학교들이 많았습니다. And that's why we had more Christians in North Korea, including uh, many uh, churches. 그리고 동화 천도교 같은 경우에는 이 주로 농촌 지역에 북, 북한 지, 북부 지역에서 농촌 지역에 확산이 됐고 기독교는 도시적으로 확산되는 특징을 보였습니다. So the contrast would be with the Dongak and eventually Chondo religion, which tended to more focus on the rural and farming communities, w e l l as the Christianity spread more in the cities. 동학이 북쪽 지역에 확산된 이유는 가보, 어, 동학농민 전쟁이 전라도에서 일어났기 때문에 탄압을 피해서 북쪽 지방에 전파를 하게 되면서 북한에 확산된 겁니다. And uh, part of the reason why uh, 동학 uh, became uh, more widespread in north is because uh, 동학 actually uh, started in c h o l a province and from c h o l a province uh, because of the persecution uh, by the uh, government Uh, many people moved upward. 동학이 1905년에 천도교로 바꾼 이후에 의례를 기독교와 똑같이 일요일 날 모여서 예배를 보는 방식으로 이제 바꿔 버립니다. And what something happened in uh, 1905 actually that's important in the history of the uh, Dongak. Uh, it actually became a Chondo religion and also the, uh, the Sundays uh, became the day of service. 일찍부터 서양 문명에 눈을 뜨고 적극적으로 받아들였던 어, 북부 지방 사람들은 기독교를 믿게 되고요. So the people in northern uh, proper uh, who turned their eyes to the outside uh, were able to receive the uh, Christianity from the west. 서양 문명에 대해서는 개방적이지만 어, 종교의 기독교에 대해서 어떤 그 약간 어, 거부감을 갖고 있고 또이 그랬던 어, 그러니까 전통적인 어떤 방식에 좀 익숙해졌던 농민들 같은 경우에 그러니까 전통적인 방식을 받아들이면서도 또한 문명에 대한 관심을 갖고 있는 상당히 이중적인 농민들은 천도교로 몰려듭니다. 
so that's what happened uh, to the cities, uh, but for the farmers and also in rural area, even in Nodom uh, pro proper, uh, they were a bit slower uh, to accept uh, the Western civilization and culture. 1910년에 조선 총독부는 모든 정치 사회 단체를 해산시켰지만 오직 종교 조직과 학교는 그대로 두었습니다. In uh, 1910, after the annexation by the Japanese, uh, they uh, had uh, dismantled pretty much all type of institution, with the exception of religion and schools. 조선 총독부가 유일하게 남겼던 사회 조직인 학교와 종교를 중심으로 삼일 운동이 일어났고 많은 학교와 그다음에 그 기독교인 천도교인이 모여 있던 북부 지방에서 주도적으로 삼일 만세 시위가 일어났던 것입니다. It was only natural uh, that these uh, movements of uh, three one uh, would be uh, centered around uh, the religions and uh, schools, uh, which were the only uh, two institutions left uh, by the Japanese. And that, that they would be more uh, widespread in the northern area. Uh, I would like to add a few uh, to that. Uh, 아까 uh, 우리 uh, 신 교수 발표에서 나왔지만 독립 신문이 1896년에 에, 생겼는데. 그게 한글로 됐습니다. 근데 마지막 장엔 한 면이 영문으로 나왔습니다. The Independent라고 해서 영문으로 어, 어, 동시문이 나왔습니다. 1896년. 1896년부터 나왔는데. 1896년. 1896년. Okay. Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, if I may add to uh, Professor Shin's uh, comments from earlier, uh, it's true uh, the newspaper, Dongnip uh, newspaper, started in 1896. But what is also true is that uh, on the last page of the Dongnip uh, newspaper, uh, the printing was in English. 근데 이때 98년에 부산 지역에서 선교를 활동하던 베어드라곤 미국인 선교사가 에, 그 사바티카를 받아서 안식년을 받아서 어, 북쪽 여행을 합니다. Uh, something happens in uh, 1898. Uh, there was a missionary uh, with the last name Baird. Uh, he was in Pusan, and he gets a sabbatical, and he takes a trip uh, northward. 근데 그 어, 가서 그 북쪽 평양을 중심으로 한 서북 지방을 돌아보고 자기 기행문을 98년 독립신문에 기재한 게 있습니다. And he goes to Pyongyang and also other uh, parts of uh, north west of uh, Korea. And once he comes back uh, to Pusan. Uh, he puts his uh, uh, travel uh, experience in writing and uh, prints it on uh, Dongnip uh, newspaper. 네, 거기에서 내가 한국의 남쪽에는 양반이라는 말이 있고 양반층이 있는데 서북 지방을 돌아보니 양반이란 사람들이 없더라. 그 대신 더 인디펜던트 미들 클래스가 있다는 것을 발견했다. 그런 말을 썼어요. And what he does uh, say after having uh, come from uh, northwest of uh, Korea is that in south uh, we have a class known as Yangban, uh, which are the nobles. Uh, however, in northwest uh, there are no nobles or Yangban class. Uh, what, rather, what he found were independent uh, middle class. <laughs> 어, 고려 왕조가 망하고 조선 왕조가 성립된 이후에 지역적인 차별을 받으면서 서북인들은 일찍이 중산층이 에, 이렇게 커졌습니다. So with the fall of the uh, dynasty of Korea in the new dynasty uh, the northwest of Korea became an outcast and as a result uh, the middle class actually had a rise in the northwest region. 근데 서북 사람이라는 이유 때문에 돈도 있고 학식도 있는데 중앙으로 출세를 할 수가 없었던 사람들이 많이 있었습니다. But uh, because of the discrimination that occurred after the fall of the uh, dynasty of Korea uh, there were many people in the northwest region of Korea who were rich and also smart, could not come into the central government. 그런 층이 기독교를 받아들이게 되는 겁니다. And those were the same people who accepted Christianity. 
미국에서 언더우드나 알렌이나 이런 사람이 온 후에 한국의 기독교가 시작된 걸로 미국에서 얘기되는데 그거는 사실이 아닙니다. It is often said in the U.S. that the missionaries such as Underwood and Allen uh, were the ones who started Christianity in Korea, but uh, that's not uh, true, actually. Underwood가 한국에 온게 1885년 4월인데 한국에는 1879년에 이미 한글 성령이 나왔습니다. 쪽보금이지만 다른. Uh, Underwood uh, came to Korea in the April of uh, 1885, but uh, a few years prior to that, in 1879, uh, South Korea already had the Bible in Korean, although it was in a miniature uh, version. Uh, uh, for example, the book of Luke and the book of John uh, had already uh, been published in uh, South Korea, I, I'm sorry, in Korea uh, back in 1882 and 1883. <laughs> Uh, perhaps uh, it would be the first time and the only unique uh, experience of the Korean people uh, that the uh, Bible would be written in the uh, Aboriginal uh, language even before the missionaries uh, had entered into their land. I think uh, it goes to uh, the background of how the Christianity had spread in South Korea by understanding the historical text uh, context. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time, um, but the good thing is you have about 10 minutes. Uh, uh, we have a 10 minute walk to the uh, location of the reception to ask additional questions of our, of our presenters. Um, so I invite you all to join us at the, the Old Korean Legation Museum, again, which is a 10 minute walk away at, at 1513th Street Northwest. Um, uh, actually, do we have any, we have a couple of student volunteers who are going to be sort of guiding us over. If you wanna raise your hand? All right, so we have Jennifer right here. Um, uh, we can assemble out in the, the uh, um, the hallway out front. Um, I really want to thank a few people, though. Um, first, I want to thank uh, um, National Assemblyman Lee Jong Gol for for uh, planting the idea uh, in my head um, of an event commemorating the uh, 100th um, anniversary of, of the the uh, Samuel um, movement um, uh, last year when we when we when we talked. But I also want to thank um, uh, my colleagues from KDI School, uh, Dean Yu, Associate Dean Lim. Uh, Su Jung Kim um, for their support uh, and and for their partnership. Um, really looking forward to to really building this um, uh, as we move forward. This is, I, I think a, an excellent start. Um, I want to thank from SICE the Korea Club and 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 the president uh, Jennifer Shin um, for really uh, helping out with with the organization and for um, uh, yeah, making sure everything ran smoothly over the course of the day. So. Thanks to all the, the student volunteers who are from the Korea Club. Uh, and then, um, of course, my colleagues in um, uh, Asia programs, uh, Sharon Yanagi, Soho Lee, and, and Meg Biddle. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. And, and again, please join us now um, in walking over to the uh, reception at the old Korean legation. So. Uh, uh, KDI에서 uh, 지원을 후원해 주시고 또 파트너십 함께 해 주신 걸 uh, 감사드립니다. 아울러서 사이스의 코리아 클럽 uh, 제네퍼 신 회장 외에 모든 자문 봉사들에게 감사를 드리고 아시아 프로그램에 속해 계신 분들 역시 감사를 드립니다. 리셉션은 여기서 10분 떨어진 곳에서 하도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 오늘.